Today is Thursday, April 11th, 2024, and you're listening to the Ask a Christian Podcast. I'm your host, Nate. All right. Is the moon made of gas? It is, if you ask uh, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, or Lee Jackson, or whatever. Uh, she thinks the moon's made of gas. She said it in front of national TV. So these are the people running our lives, everyone. Then we talk about politics for the next hour, because, uh, I don't know, no one has questions about religion. Um, it's kind of why we're here. Um, anyway, so if uh, if uh, political stuff with a Christian leaning bent is your thing, we cover all the all the uh, new events going on. Then we uh, talk about other stuff for a while, and we get into dreams and interpretation. Is that a thing? Does God send dreams? Um, how do you know? How would you know? Um, so we talk about that for a while, and then we share all of our wacky dreams. For the record, I am looking for an interpreter of my giant spider dream. So if you are a dream interpreter, um, I probably won't believe you. But if you could tell me what my giant spider dream means, <laughs> send me an email. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> we can't all be Daniel, right? Am I right? So, uh, yeah, that's it. Enjoy this conversation and have an awesome day. See you all next time, which will be like tomorrow. Okay, so how many people have recently heard the moon is made of gas? Anyone oh, heard yeah. that? Sheila Jackson Lee. Yep, let's hear it. Here we go. Provide unique light and energy so that you have the energy of the moon at night. And sometimes you've heard the word full moon. Sometimes you need to take the opportunity just to come out and see a full moon is that complete rounded circle, which is made up mostly of gases. And that's why the question, the question is why or how could we as humans live on the moon. Uh, the gas is such that we could do that. The sun is a mighty powerful heat. It is almost impossible to go near the sun. The moon is more manageable. And you will see uh, in a moment, or not a moment, you'll see in a couple of years that NASA is going back to the moon. Okay, so Michael, <clears throat> Say what you want about Canadian politics, and maybe the left up there is a little more um, not ridiculous. But these are our Congress people. So these are our Democratic Congress people that think the moon is made of freaking gas, and the sun is almost too hot to get close to. Almost. So, Michael, are you dealing with that level of stuff in uh, the great land of Canada, or are we just uh, blessed to have this level of ignorance here? Um, yeah, the latter rather than the former. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, I, I have, I actually read a story a couple of days ago about NASA perhaps wanting to go back to the moon. Not sure why, who knows? I'm not an astrophysicist. This woman clearly isn't either. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you, yeah, we can't, I forget how close it is. So there were calculations that were done as to how close we could get to the sun. Um, we wouldn't ever have to worry about getting to the surface of the sun. We'd have a better chance surviving on the surface of the sun than we would in the corona because the corona is millions and millions of degrees hotter than the surface of the sun. Um, yeah, this, this woman should not be taken seriously and someone should take away her, her pencils. Well, I mean, I think we got to, um, what, like we sent a probe to Mercury, right? It's like, what, the surface is like 800 degrees? Like, didn't we have a probe that survived there for a while? It didn't land on Mercury. So like we had a close to it? So the it, Russians it? actually got a probe to land on Venus, but it only lasted, I believe, 12 minutes. Oh, wow. But anyway, but, but yeah, so I mean, if you could get like in the orbit of Mercury, uh, what, I mean, 800 degrees, I mean, you know, there's stuff that could we could come up with that could probably survive a couple, like 1,500, oh, yeah. 2,000 degrees for a little while. Well, yeah, but there's, but, there's mean, differences between, like, like we don't even measure the, the, the corona in degrees. We measured in, in degrees Kelvin. Like, that's how hot it is. Like, it's exponentially higher. I mean, I guess the only thing worse is if she would have said, like, the moon is made of cheese. But, um, I, I mean, I did see um, a little debate clip, um, a little debate clip with uh, your dear leader, Trudeau, Aren't you proud of me? I got his name down now. Like, I think I had it before I started trying to talk to you about it, and then I messed it up somehow. But now I've got it back. So It's, per it's performance anxiety. It's okay. <laughs> so she said, what? So um, anyway, um, um, I, I saw a clip of him. And he did you see any of that? Or am I more interested in your politics than he uh, – well, really, it was just a clip on another news program. But it was him and his opponent doing a debate. And uh, 
man, I forget the guy's name, the opponent, the one that I think is supposed to basically win. Um, Pierre Paulier. Man, the, yeah, so like, do you? I don't know anything about him except the 30-second clip I saw, but it got like all of, what is it, Parliament? Is that what it's called there? Um, the chamber or whatever. Like they were all like jumping up and shouting and like cheering him on. And, uh, you know, the incumbent didn't do so well in his retort. Well, so it's – so it basically um, – the way Canadian Parliament is set up is basically you've got uh, – is you, you'll have the, the ruling party on one side. And then you'll have the official opposition and the other party on the other side. So, it, so it's very much set up like a, like a tennis match. So people go back and forth and back and forth. Um, what you probably find – like I wouldn't be surprised if you had even some people on the, on the liberal side. Um, cheering some of the things that Polly have said over some of the things that Trudeau has done, because like I said before, one, I'm not his biggest fan, and two, he's done some stuff that is not great. Um, he is still a better alternative. It's it's like it's almost like my view on what's going on with you guys, right? Um, you know, Biden is older than dirt, right? Um, Trump is, a, is, is approaching that. Like everybody's saying, oh, he's, a, he's still, he's only like four years younger. Um, so you have two old guys, right? But who's the lesser of the evils, right? And so you have the, virtually the same thing going on here. Um, but who's the lesser of the evils? And for me, the lesser of the evils is, is still Trudeau. I would, I would love, as I said before, I would love to be able to vote NDP. Um, which would be a bit like voting for Bernie Sanders, if you don't remember. Um, but because the NDP doesn't have enough of a following, all it would do is split the vote. It would be like voting for Jill Stein, right? She's never going to get anywhere, um, and all she's going to do is upset you know, is, is upset the voters who voted for her because they thought she had a chance. Or it will be like voting for RFK this year, which you know, hopefully will peel away from Biden uh, more than Trump. But uh, well, yeah, yeah it, can, it, can, it, can it, you it, imagine it's like – Adam and his descendants to pick. Adam, you're 900. Pick, but it's a young 900. <laughs> but the problem, but I mean, see, the problem is, is that there's actually there was a report that came out the other day. Um, what the basically the campaign secretary for RFK in New York. There's audio of her saying, like in a in a public forum, that that basically. His campaign basically being a voice box for him, uh, and uh, and uh, Trump's campaign have a common enemy, that being Joe Biden. So, right now, the last poll that I saw said that RFK was pulling about four percent of people from Trump. And about five and a half percent of people from Biden, so pulling a little bit more from Biden. Um, they're expecting that to shift when news of this gets out, because what was happening was, my my understanding from what I read, is that there were people who were going to vote for RFK because they didn't want the, they didn't want to reconcile a Trump vote for themselves, but they weren't happy with Biden. My thought is, my personal opinion, as a professional political correspondent, um, <laughs> is that. People are going to get wind of, of this news, and they're going to be like, no. And they're going to end up going and, – and I think this is what's going to happen a lot of times. I think people that have said, I don't want to vote for Trump, I don't want to vote for Trump, I won't vote for Trump, I think on voting day we'll still vote for him. Yeah, and, I, I th and I think the same thing is true of the people on the left. They'll be like, I don't want to vote for Biden, and then they'll look at what's at stake, and they'll vote for Biden. Yeah, I, I mean – and there's still plenty of time for things to change, but I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, our RFK, like, because it's, it's already flipped, like, several times based on what he's done and, like, interviews. People are like, oh, I think it's good for Trump. Oh, I think it's good for Biden. So it's already flipped, like, a couple times, and I guess this is, you know, perhaps one more. Yeah. But it's like, um, I mean, it's, it's like, dude, the, Dem the Democrats are so – goodness. It's like they've tried everything to make him make him not be able to run as a Democrat. So it's like now he's got to be like independent, independent or I think he was trying to make a deal with the Libertarian Party maybe or something. Um, yeah, but maybe. it's like if you guys weren't just so slimy and would play fair, it's like, look, if the guy wants to run as a Democrat and challenge you, stop trying to use like legal legal means to keep him off the balance. Like let the guy get on the balance. Like run a fair fight. Is that is that concept so uh, – I got to go quiet for a couple. I got to go quiet for a couple. Yeah. But it's like is that – 
idea of just like fair play so foreign to, to the people on that side who are in power. Um, but anyway, uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Hang on, there's one thing I want to say, and then it goes both ways, dude. Like, if the Republicans what? had that kind of institutional power, they would use it. You, know, you don't, don't know. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay. There, I don't know how you can say that. It's like even the the stuff with like um ah. Like, what was the guy's name? The first gay guy from New York. The, Santos. Even that, right? It's like, it, it was up to them. But on some, some ground of ethics, which I guess technically, I guess, good job, like at all costs, even when you know your opposing side will never repay that same ethical courtesy, um, you know, they kick that guy out. It's like, if the Democrats, like, Democrats would do that, it's like, oh, it's Tuesday. This guy lied about some stuff. Yep, it's Monday. Um but the Republicans, for whatever reason, got all up in arms and got some moral high horse, which if that's their honest-to-God reason, I guess somehow a good job. But it just makes you think. It's like, are, are you ignorant or are, are you really just trying to like go down with the ship on a moral high ground? No, because it's a political calculation, Nate. They know it, that the other side controls the media, and so they're trying not to take it on the chin in the media by doing the media's bidding. That's, Man, the, that's the motivation and, of and, all Republicans. Wait, wait, hang, hang on, and, hang on. I want, I want, wait, wait, hang on, CEO. Um, I, I'm still trying to think of what I was trying to say, but I, I almost forgot it. Maybe I did forget it. But Chris, you're, I mean, I've got some tinfoil to sell you. Like, um, I forgot what I was going to say. Okay, CEO, you. What's up? So, so Nate, do you not remember Al Franken? The Democrats yep, destroyed him. So. The Democrats have had plenty of in incidences where they've ate Barone. So well, I think that both sides of it, it, it's contextual. You know what it really boils down to, Nate? How well the person actually fights back. That's what it boils down to, right? Well, no, the people it, who fight back longer end up surviving typically. Well, wait, do you remember? Um, okay, Al Franken, it's almost like Caiaphas. Like if the Democrats were Caiaphas, it's like, what's politically expedient? Like, did he, I mean, you know, he was old. Uh, was he playing ball on their team? Was he too moderate? Was he not doing their will? So it's like every now and then we'll like get, you know, we'll like do something that most people consider the right thing to do uh, because it serves their purpose. It's like, remember Barney, uh, Bar what was it? Barney Frank. Remember that guy? Uh, remember how he like got all kinds of these like rape accusations, all these other stuff. And basically the Democrats were like trying because he's outlived their usefulness. I, I forget the reason. I don't think it was a, um, uh, he was too moderate or something. I don't think that was it, but there was, there was some, reason people were, were saying at the time it's like well look uh, they were turning against him because he outlived his usefulness to the party and he wasn't playing ball with whatever the issue at the time was that he wasn't playing ball on so basically they dug off all this stuff and it was like them who started these accusations of all these like you know gay sex like you know involuntary i think i, I don't remember exactly it's a long time ago but basically the only reason they didn't like destroy him and like let him just peacefully you know live out his existence is because he, he said had so much evidence on the other people of his colleagues who were doing the same thing. He's basically like, look, guys, if you don't stop, I'm taking you all down with me. And just like that, their moral high horse went away, and he rode off into the sunset nice and peaceful. So, I mean, yeah, I'm not saying there's not political reasons. I'm just saying, man, the optics are just are incredibly infuriating. When it's like, oh, we this one Republican did something bad. We've got to eat him alive. When there's like like – what, like five examples maybe in the history of Democrats doing this that they've been called on? Like, you couldn't throw a rock in Congress right now and hit a Democrat that hadn't done something just grossly obscene. I mean, probably same with Republicans, but I mean, if, if the Republican leadership gets word of it and they're not like a, you know, they're much more quick to pull that trigger and eat their own than the Democrats. It's like they'll fight to the death unless they no longer serve their purpose. Anyway. Well, I only think Matt Gates needed because he fought for them, right? Oh, Matt you're chopping up really bad, CEO. What a lot. CEO, we don't hear you either. You're chopping up real bad. Um, maybe give it a minute when you get better service. Uh, Dimity, what's up? Well, speaking speaking of pragmatism and political expedience. You gonna say abortion? Um, yeah, like Trump fighting big one on that one. Well, yeah, that that's a question, right? Because like, it's a very big divide, and you know, it's one that was kind of like an unforced error. Um, but now, again, all these moral people, which I like to think I'm one of them, but I also, you know, have eyeballs and live in reality. So it's like, okay, they're like, no, not even one abortion, not even one national abortion ban, not even one. It's like, okay, that's a great stance. In theory, I agree. 
in reality, if he takes that stance, grossly gets trounced because of that stance, then not only is it your wish, like not even one, it's like millions up on millions that otherwise wouldn't be. So yeah, I guess it's a numbers game, but I mean, I don't know. What do you think about that? Because it's like, it's like, I know it is pragmatism. Are, are you on the side of pragmatism or against the side of pragmatism? Because the other day you were giving Trump crap for that. For being a pragmatist? Yeah, and your audio is also not great right now. I think I think it's a great position for Trump. I mean, state rights, it actually makes sense. The position makes a lot of sense. But that's not what happened, CEO. What happened was that he went after Arizona specifically and said that Arizona went too far for him. Oh, yeah, I think he should have just stayed specific with his position and not said anything about it, because it's a reasonable take, because our states are like European countries, right? The cultures are very different. So let people work it out how they want to work it out. Oh, yeah, no, I don't agree with that at all. <laughs> What's up, Sean? Why, why not? Why not, Chris? I would like to get your take on um, what uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia has said uh, about if it had been her, January's, January 6th insurrection would have been a success. Um, I, did she say that recently? I haven't heard anything about yeah, that. She said it. <laughs> she said it. Okay, well, get me a link with the uh, clip in context, uh, and uh, I guess uh, I'll watch it and give you my thoughts. <laughs> all right. Um, I have a feeling it's going to be one of the. Uh, I, yeah, I have I, a feel- I, I, As a Democrat, I'm going to say this. I recognize that there are, on both sides, folk that actually say some very stupid stuff. <laughs> I, uh,. Because I, I, I said I said she can't be that stupid to say that. She's a but brilliant I, marketer. She's a brilliant marketer. <clears throat> She's one of the best marketers in the country. I mean, I've heard her say some other stuff that's kind of questionable. I haven't heard that. I have a feeling if you get me that clip in context, it's going to be one of the things about, like, you know, the Bible um, where, you know, we just read, like, you know, a little bit above or below. And it's like, oh, yeah, it's not the case you're trying to make at all, Mr. Like, you know, Israelite or atheist or whatever. Um, I just have a feeling. It's just my sense. But, um, I, I mean – for her to say something like, you know, if it was up to her, it would have been a success, meaning like a true sense of the word, like, I don't know, violent overthrowing of the entire government. Um, if you're like, hey, is that what you meant? I have a feeling she'd be like, oh, no, no, that's not what I meant. Like, I don't want, any, I don't want people to die. I don't want to, like, you know, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, that's just my sense, my un, uneducated guess, but I'd like to see the clip if you got one. Um, uh, let's see, what else? See, do you have anything else to say? Hey. I was just going to, I, 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 I was, well, I'll let Chris go because I was going to transition to a biblical topic based on something Michael they said. They have their voting right. rights rescinded and generationally have their voting rights rescinded for three generations. How about Ooh. that? What are you talking about? Anybody who's ever voted for a Democrat should have their voting rights rescinded for three generations. That would fix the country. <laughs> well, I mean... Sounds pretty good from where I am. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I like the idea of like, uh, I mean, again, it would be unconstitutional, but I mean, I like the idea that if you move from a blue state to a red state, there's a waiting period before you get to vote um, in order to see how things are here instead of like bringing your crappy policies um, immediately behind you and, you know, causing like a wake of destruction um, and then being like, wait, why did that happen? <laughs> I like that idea. If someone could figure out how to make that happen. Uh, CEO, Bible topic. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so Michael, you, earlier you were talking about um, something about, oh yeah, you said uh, Biden's older than dirt. So I wanted to ask you about, are you familiar with the biblical verse in the Old Testament that says post-flood, man should not live past 120 years old. And this is written like, I don't know, 3,500 years ago or something. And we only have one recorded case ever of anyone living over 120. What do you think of that? 
Is he back yet? I know he said he had to go away for a minute. We may have to revisit that when he gets back. Okay. Um, I'm going to say that he would say the Bible's right, and he will um, convert right now. <laughs> hey Nick, what's Man, up? Nobody, nobody wanted to touch my, nobody wanted to touch my like generational voting rights thing. Like, come well, on! I, 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 I said I'll what I mean out there. Uh, Chris, Chris, I said it's a good there idea. is, Chris, there is a Democrat named Lisa Blunt Rochester in Delaware. She is absolutely a wonderful human being. So, stop. There are some well, good Democrats, and there have been the last 25. Well, Wes Clark. Wes Clark. I worked on General Wesley Clark's Clark campaign, Clark campaign in 2004. He was, 2004. was, he was great. great. Chris, you got to your, your audio is awful today. Awful Can you fix that? That's that's awful. Um, I don't, I don't know what's going on. Get a different device. But um, I mean, sure, there are some good Democrats. I mean, that's like I'm sure maybe there's a unicorn somewhere out there, but you know, it's hard to that's find. That's me. Man. But I mean, I'm a good, <clears throat> me, I'm a good Democrat. <laughs> well, we'll see in a minute. Um, I believe you. But um, it, it's like, you know, a lot of the good Democrats, though, like, uh, have left the party. Like, they've either, you know, switched to independent or some of them even switched to Republican, um, which, you know, it's another side of the evil coin, just not quite as evil. Um, but, I mean, you know, a lot of the good, quote, good Democrats have, have left their party um, because they're like, I just can't participate in this anymore. But uh, Nick was Nick was next. What's up, Nick? How are you doing? Good, good, good. No, and, and Nate, to your point earlier, like – you need to have better quality, like, voters and, and like, just given a class on, like, basic economics because – and on both parties, they do not understand. And I think – because I'm a libertarian, but if they truly understood basic economics and how things work, investing, taxation, I really don't think people would vote Democrat or Republican. I agree with that, and I think, uh, Chris, but, you know, your you, – Chris's unpopular stance about – <laughs> the worst thing to happen since voting is uh, women voters. I'm no, totally not saying that. Correct. I don't think I'm women should have a right to vote. Right, right. And I'm totally not saying that, but you can see his point. Um, okay, so because we had that discussion, right, and it comes down to emotional voting. So, you know, there are women who are not emotional, and there are men who are incredibly blubbering emotional, you know, people. Um, but th that's an exception, not the rule. The rule is, you know, biology is different, and, you know, women – have a tendency to generally be more emotional about certain things and empathetic, which can be a great thing for certain things for voting where you need black and white logic, like hard stone cold facts, um, you know, weak minded, emotional men, or, you know, um, generally <laughs> more women than not. <laughs> this is where we get canceled right now. Um, that's the thing. Like, I think if I could pick one thing more than anything else, it would be stop emotional voting. If there was a way to force uh, non-emotional voting, I think uh, there would be enough people who, who see the light and don't vote through emotion that the country would be ran in a pretty good way, I think. That's my bet. There is, there is a way to do that. There is a way yeah. to do that. Well, well, hang, 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 well, hang, hang on, Theo. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, guys, come on. I, I can't be yelling all day. When, when I want to say something, just indulge me. I'm try I want to get Chris to say something so he can dig himself a hole so people don't see the one I just dug myself that much. Chris, please respond and make it worse for yourself and better for me. You can literally trace all of the ills of our country back to lady uh, to uh, women's suffrage. Okay, thank you. Uh, CEO. Yeah, so there's an easy way to do this. So, you know, Constitution says no taxation without representation. So if you want to give all these quote unquote emotional voters the right to opt out of paying taxes in exchange for not being able to vote, niggers, I'm sure niggers, you would niggers, get niggers, I'm sure you would niggers, get niggers, uh, niggers. Okay. I'm uh, now I'm going to go out on a limb real fast and say while I believe most people who say they're atheists and they can be a good moral atheist without the belief in a god or gods, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that guy is probably someone who is not religiously affiliated. Perhaps he doesn't believe in the existence of a god or gods, um, but that is someone who does not seem to be able to be a good moral person without the belief in a god. So, uh, you know, repent and believe the gospel. Uh, carry on, CEO. Yeah, so so if you want to give all those emotional people an opt-out button where in exchange for them trading the right to vote, they don't ever have to pay taxes again, I'm sure you would get a good amount of percentage of people to sign up for that. Okay, can we cool. Just put for the, so for then the we fact, can just 
We Pretty could silly. reinstitute the patriarchy and make it illegal for women to work outside of the home. In the, in the, in the so there you go. Facts, that solves your problem, CEO. Yes, yeah, the interesting facts. The Constitution doesn't say no taxation without representation. Okay? That just does. That's not. No, that was oh, a well, found, that was a slogan in the oh god in the 18th okay. century. But I'm just saying the Constitution doesn't say that, right? I mean, it's just. I'm an old-fashioned well, guy with. Well, there's something guys. adjacent to that, though, isn't there, Scott? What it, what it, what, why, why is that such a popular kind of saying? No, it's a popular conception, but people, we do tax citizens without representation. If you're in D.C. or Puerto Rico, you get taxed without representation in Congress. You get federal taxation without. So we we allow it. What? I mean, it's not. Yeah. Scott. Yeah. Do, no, they yeah, do not yeah. pay income taxes in. Uh, in Puerto Rico. What are you talking about? Or in DC. Yeah, yeah, they do. I'm a CPA. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they, do. Yeah, they pay do. income. They're US tax. residents. They're US residents, yeah. Huh. Yeah. Let's let's yeah. Uh, Nate, why don't you look in the AI for us? Hang on, I'm watching Green's clip. Well, let, I mean, let's I, admit let's admit though, Scott, that that is a kind of key principle we live by and i and i still hold by my argument that if you want to, if you because look i i bet you you could probably get like 20 percent at least of people to agree with this i don't vote i don't pay taxes i mean uh, you've already got I, a whole bunch of people that don't pay taxes that get to vote i mean sure. like no no but they pay, they pay they still pay fica tax you, you, you're not taking that out. That could be federal tax. They don't pay, but they're still paying FICA. Yeah. So I think FICA is ridiculous. I think it should be banned. Um, I'm with you. you. Know, yeah. There's lots of, lots of ways to fix these things. I think that uh, being able for the federal government to be able to take um, their donations out of the checks of people should absolutely be illegal. I can get um, behind that. Yeah, I can. I can. Yep, I, can I agree. That. And hey, with that, CEO had a Bible point, but first, uh, yeah, Sean, I, I just watched the clip um, from CNN, oh, Lord help you, brother, um, but I watched it. It is not hard um, to come away with a different, a different understanding of that. So it's not like she's like, uh, you know, there are some things that it's very black and white, right? Um, no matter what you think of her, um, that's not one of those. So I watched the clip. I watched it in context. It was a four-minute clip. I watched the, the part where her clip wasn't that long, but the whole thing was four minutes. Um, but she said, she's like, look, uh, January 6th, blah, blah, blah. They thought it was armed insurrection, or they thought it was insurrection. And she's like, uh, a bunch of people unarmed, blah, blah, blah. Like, how can they say that? She's like, if I would organize that, we would have been armed and we would have won. Um, so the first thing is, well, she didn't organize that. So there's that. Um, but then she went on to say, uh, that's the old joke, right? Like, you know, people, blah, 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 you think you can come in here with arms and whatever. But she's like, no, that's not how it is. So she went on in the very same thing that they, they in the same clip, to say, yeah, if she would have organized it, they would have been armed and they would have went uh, won. Um, but then she says, that's the old joke, right? Like if people go in and they blah, 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 she's like, that's what they want to say. So she kind of like explains it away right there that, she wasn't trying to have an armed insurrection or she wasn't hoping for an armed insurrection anyway. So I see how you can get your, your side of it though, Sean, like, I mean, you know, she said it, I mean, she immediately kind of, you know, clarified or kind of like talked about her overall point, but yeah, I mean, if you want to, you know, I, I think mine would be the charitable side and yours would be the uncharitable side. Uh, but the point is it's very easy to read multiple interpretations of that. It's not like she said, Gosh darn it, I wish I would have organized and we would have been armed and we would have killed people and took back our country. Yeah. Um, that would have been, you know, that would have been pretty difficult. Um, anyway, the ch uh, clip's over there if you guys want to see it in the chat. The CEO, you had a Bible point. I thought yeah, it was Michael back. back. Michael yeah. back. Okay, Michael's back. Okay, great. So, so Michael, so you earlier said that, uh, you know, Joe Biden's older than dirt. It made me think about... Uh, um, age in general, and I wanted to ask you if you're familiar with the Bible verse about uh, it saying that no no one will live past the age of 120 after the, the flood time. And there's only been one case ever of someone living over 120 years old since that time, and this was written 3,500 years ago. So, how what what do you account to the accuracy of that statement written 3,500 years ago? 
Uh, what book of the Bible is that from? Uh, give me a second. Hold on. It's in Genesis. Okay, so assuming what Chris has said is correct, I don't uh, like I, I don't find the Bible to be a trustworthy document in the first place. So the chances of it being thirty five hundred years old is possible because we have writing much older than that. Like the Bible is Genesis so clearly six three. Six yeah, three. Yeah, because the Bible is so clearly not the first book ever written. Like there are books thousands of years older than that. Um, much to Christian chagrin. So, but uh, yeah, kind of my thinking on that is who cares? Like if 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 after that was written, even one person lived longer than that, that means the Bible's wrong, right? No. Oh, it doesn't. Correct. So the Bible said no one will live past this and somebody lived past this. So the inspired word of God was wrong just one time. So because you're being pedantic and overly literal, that's the problem. Oh, right. Right. So if, so if, so, the, so if the Bible says this won't happen again, there should just be an asterisk for that saying eh, it might happen once. Well, it doesn't say it will not. I mean, it, I mean, use interpretive language, but I, I think it says, I mean, maybe the translation is different. So, you know, go to the actual thing. But I mean, it says like, you know, it's not good or man should not live past this. Right. So, I mean, it, it you can you can read that into it kind of like, you know, we just did with MTG and her insurrection thing. Uh, you can read it into it. But I mean, is that correct? I mean, if it, if that's really the way it was supposed to be, you would think it would be more poignant and say something like man shall not live beyond this year. Oh, I don't know. Like, I was just going. I was just going well, based what, on what C. I was just going well, based on what CEO said. Oh, oh Michael, so if let's what, just do if a what CEO said wasn't quite right. Then that's well, that's fine. Well, Michael, but let's just do a like if we we're going to do a statistical analysis around this, right? The age of 120 for people. <laughs> or, Phone call. 120 oh. for people to say that 3,000 years ago. And only one person ever made it. And it's not like it said 200, a number of humans don't even get to. But if you were to use like a scientific statistical analysis of that statement and look at the accuracy of it, it would be rated as one of the most incredible statements in the ancient world in terms of how it's actually played out. I don't understand why this is at all interesting. If somebody lives over 100, it's... I don't know. By the way, Nate, I wanted to comment on your emotional voting thing. I think on everybody what? votes on your emotional voting thing. I think everybody votes emotionally. I think, I mean, I think it's a minority of people that vote for ideological, intellectual reasons. I think most people vote. That's why people. Uh, that's why political campaigns spend money on emotional commercials and music. And oh well, yeah, they. Well, well yeah, yeah, they try to. They try to do it. I mean, there's no one saying like people are trying to get people to vote intellectually. I mean, but no one, no one's saying that. I mean, of course they, they want to play on emotions because when you don't have facts, I mean, emotions serve a great purpose. It's like, Hey, don't worry about the facts. Don't worry about if we can't afford it. Um, you know, look at these, look at these like, you know, starving puppies over here. You have to feed them. It's like, how could you not vote for starving puppies? It's like, no, we'd love to vote for starving puppies, but we don't have money. We can't feed the puppies. If we vote for starving puppies, they're going to die anyway, and you're going to script in more things because we don't have money for dying puppies. It's like oh. you're a monster. Nate, this is a good one. Okay, so I just had this discussion on X. So tell me what you think of this one. Do you think disabled children should have a right to health care? Sure. Okay, good. Because I have <laughs> ran into somebody. No, no, that, no, oh. no. That's okay. dumb. Oh, person. Okay. There's no such thing as a right to health care. That's stupid. And Nate, you, he just destroyed your uh, argument. No, no, he he got me at he got me at like you know right, like constitutional right. I, I wasn't paying attention to that. I just thought he was asking like in general, like you know, should disabled people have you know be taken care of, like as opposed to taking them out to the barn. Like I thought, I thought it was one of those. I, I yeah. So I, I that's. Invalid data, CEO. I wasn't. I wasn't thinking you meant right. Like it should be enshrined. Like you know. I just think. Uh, I just think this right. is this whole point at a great point. Uh, Chris, do you have the right to a gun? Absolutely. Okay, so I just want to point out for everyone that is listening now will ever listen to this that the Christian thinks no, no, no. You don't have the right to health care, but you do have the right to carry a gun that will take someone else's health care away from you. 
That is like I Chris, I'm more Christian than you could ever be. Right. Hang on. So, there, there, wait, so wait, again, a, you don't understand what rights are. There's a lot to unpack here. Yeah. Okay, so let, let me do this again. Do I think it should be enshrined like you know as a constitutional right? Uh, no, I, I think there should be very few of those. I mean, some of those is, you know, 2A, right? And like unalienable rights and things like that. Like, because the idea, Chris, it, it, maybe you can expound or this is where you're going. Like in our constitution, like, you know, some of these rights, it was it was agreed upon that they were given by God. So that's why it's not like a, a judicial body or the Supreme Court or something like that can cannot just say, oh, well, now we decide to change these rights. It, it was enshrined by God in the wording of the constitution, right? So like, no matter what a human does, you cannot take these unalienable rights away because they weren't given by man. So the idea is they can't be taken away by man. They were given by God. And, and there was only a handful of those. So it's like if you want to say other people have like, you know, like some people are pushing the right to Internet, like Internet is a human right. I mean, if you want to say that, but not consider it like the, the right we're talking about, like given by God. Well, sure. But it has a different meaning behind it. Is that where you're going, Chris? Yeah. Go there. Do you want to? Explain? I gotta go quiet for a little bit, guys. I'll try to come back. You want to expand on that, Chris? Yeah, I mean, they're like rights are things that you know we have apart from government, right? They are in alien, like, like the founders said, inalienable human rights. Um, you know, the whether or not whether or not we have those things, i.e. a right to a gun, a right to a gun is an unalienable human right that government does not grant, that it is simply innate to a human being to be able to perform self-defense, okay? So like that is, or, or rebel against their tyrannical government, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, do I have a right to Michael's labor? Do I have a right to enslave Michael um, and make him make me delicious Canadian scones every day for now on that, I will say yes. I mean, so I would be generous and say, no, I do not have a right to enslave Michael and make him make me delicious buttery scones every day. That is simply not a right that I have, but I do have a right to self-defense. So if, you know, CEO is rushing at, oh, he's not here, but, you know, or if Nate is rushing at me with a machete screaming, he's going to chop me into tiny bits. I have every right to shoot Nate. So there's a huge difference there. I don't have a right to Michael's labor, um, but I do have a right to uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness because those are unalienable human rights. And to, to add more to that, um, um, yeah, like whenever I, whenever, um, you know, now that I guess we're all assuming disabled people hopefully should be taken care of, um, even though it's not like a right, uh, you know, in this context, I mean, I think that, I mean, that is really the more Christian position, is it not? Um, even if you don't believe it, it's not a force. Like your charity is, is not a force. Like, you know, God loves a cheerful giver. Is to be like an act of service, you know, an act of, you know, loving your neighbor and stuff like that. So you've already like, like lost the plot if you need the government to try to force this. Um, so uh, no, like in the context of God given rights, you know, disabled people or no one should have a right of that, that nature um, to health care. But yes, I totally believe, uh, believe they should be taken care of. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, we do that now. Like, I don't think, uh, you know, we don't have a right to health care. Um, but we still have plenty of safety, social safety nets that take care of disabled people and all kinds of other people. And we have like whole government funding. So the government is doing uh, oh. the things people are wanting. Right. It's but that's bad too. Well, that's well, horrible <laughs> too, because the government is simply <clears throat> is enslaving me in a different way. Um, I, I, so like yeah, the, yeah, the best not, thing is for the church to take care of its own members. Um, I don't. I don't know what would happen if I was ever able to like finish a, a sentence, even though it's long. Um, that, that's where I was May going. I say so, this? so May I no, <laughs> wait. I am determined to get through a talking point. So if the government, uh, they're doing that, right? So it's not called a right, but the government is doing that right now. So the thing people is say are, are saying they want the government to do, they're doing it. It's just not technically called a right. 
But the more Christian thing is to free will do it of your own volition, and it should be, in the, in the ideal scenario, by way of religious organizations, but since I'm a Christian, um, it should be, you know, the church, um, you know, of Christ. Like, the body of Christ should be the ones doing this, and then, you know, whatever other independent, non-government w- group wants to do it, sure, jump on the bandwagon. But no, it, it shouldn't be robbed because that's still force, right? So even though it's not a right that you're being, uh, being forced to, you're still having your tax dollars forced to take care of that. So yes, Chris, we, we agree. Uh, uh, Sean. Okay, I'm a disabled veteran. Okay, so so you saying that my me what I did fighting for my country, wearing the uniform, and I come out a disabled veteran. I shouldn't be able to uh, get get the health care that I that I deserve. No, I, 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 would, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I don't know what Chris is going to say, but I guess he just said it. Uh, that's different. That so that's irrelevant to this discussion because you're not just um, you know you're not just a person who's like, hey government, um, I need you to pay for my health care. You did a service. You worked for the government. They were your employer. You were in their employ. So it's right, I think, just like anyone else who you know has um, you know who has insurance with the company they work, even though it's stupid. Insurance should not follow your job, but for now that's how it is. So just like anyone else that you know gets hurt on the job, they have workman's comp, they have insurance through their company. So your your company, your job was the government. So you uh, and the VA system, I don't have a pro- I mean I have a problem with the waste and abuse, but I don't have a problem with them taking care of their own veterans and not just disabled, but it's, it's their employees. So like you know the contract this employer has is hey um, you know you get you get all these benefits, you can get college, you can get health care, blah blah blah. So you don't even have to be disabled. And that is a perk for going and serving your country and working for the government. So that's a completely different issue. But, I mean, I think that's fine, Sean, Um, because you did a job. This was part of what you signed up for. It's like, here's the benefits. Sean, thoughts? Great. And, and Sean, actually, I think that you should get better health care. I think the VA should be abolished. And that you should have a voucher for health care that you can go to any private doctor or hospital and the government will pay for that treatment, um, you know, because you are a disabled veteran. So I think that the VA is terrible. I think it should be abolished. And I think that you as a disabled veteran should give be me able your to reasons go to any why. doctor. Don't just tell me that. Give me your reasons why. Why what? The VA sucks? Why should the VA system be abolished? Because of the VA system now, I, because I, I it sucks. Can, hold on, hold on. Let me let me make a, let me finish my statement. If because I get to go to outside private doctors, they actually uh, partner with private doctors outside the VA. Trump made that possible. Just saying. <laughs> but I, I was doing that before Trump. All right, but like he I helped. mean. Yeah, I mean, but, like, the VA is serving no purpose other than government waste and making and, – and once again, our the American government has a terrible, terrible track record of taking care of its veterans since we were a country, okay? And then we invented this crappy system called the VA to further abuse our veterans. So that's why it should be abolished. It's, 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 it's terrible. Why wouldn't you just – instead of just – Go into the VA hospital, you know, where they're pushing, you know, opiates on people uh, all the time. And this is a whole thing in the VA. Um, and it was a huge scandal. Uh, why wouldn't you just want to go to any private health care network and have insurance paid for by the government? That would be the abolition of the VA. That would be a thousand times better than going to some crappy, dirty hospital. And he says he does anyway. So, I mean, if you're already going to private care, I mean, the only thing different is, you know, the VA hospitals and stuff just doesn't exist. And everyone goes to their private health care and, you know, they get to pick. So, and it's still paid for. So, I, I mean, I don't even see a problem with that. Well, you I mean, mean like, I, like, I, like I can do, like I can do here. Well, yeah, I, I see a problem with that. Like that's brain right. Cancer that's why all, something and then yeah, you just that, die. That, that's why all the Canadians are fleeing down here for surgeries because elective surgeries are prioritized for social reasons in Canada. So um, that's, over just, like, that's just not true. Um, yeah, like well, I guess if, we have to wait and see what happens with the gender. So there, yeah. Cases. So I mean, you you have you have you do have situations 
where, and uh, this is something my, my wife works with a fair bit. My, my wife is a, she's been in cancer fundraising and research for 22 years. And so there are places in the U.S. that have been working on it longer and so have developed other things. And so she works closely in conjunction with organizations like NACTO, which is an association for cancer fundraisers and other things, where um, Canadian hospitals and U.S. hospitals will work together to do research and treatment. There are lots of cases, lots of cases, where American patients come here for treatment as well. It, you, you just hear about it more for some reason going the other way. And I think it's mostly sped, but spread by the right-wing propagandists that, that think that socialized medicine doesn't work. Sadly, it does. And, it, and so that's why you hear about these things. But like, if I were to get my wife on here right now, we're both home today. She's working from home. And I'm, I am as well. And we've got an electrician coming by for that, that crazy woke electric car we bought. Um, <laughs> um, so she could tell you about the probably hundreds and hundreds of people that she's worked with that have had patients come north of the border as well. So, yeah. And I mean, you know, we've talked about this before, but it's like, you know, my wife works and I'm just going to keep on talking, (laughs) but we've talked about this before, but you know, if I got my wife on the phone, you know, she's in the rehab, uh, rehab part and, you know, she, she talks to Canadian patients. So I mean, maybe they're five or far right Canadian people, but for whatever reason, uh, you know, they, they come down here for things like, like most recently we were talking about like, it was a heart, uh, a heart related surgery. And they're like, no, we had to come down here. And she meets them all the time. Cause it's like Canadian, like snowbird land for the winter. So there's like Canadians everywhere. Um, and you know, a lot of them she finds in rehab and it's because they came down here for procedures and they're like, no, like we would have died. Like we had to get insurance down here. We had to come down here. Um, because the amount of time we would have had to wait my, my wife or my husband, they would have died. So, I mean, if it's a right wing propaganda, I mean, a lot of Canadian citizens apparently believe it because their doctors have gave them a wait list that's so long that they're like, we'll die, and they've had to come down here. Um, so, I mean, you know, just anecdotal experience. Uh, what, Chris? There's also a difference between going and seeing a certain specialist in a certain field that happens to practice medicine in a certain place versus the what Nate is describing and literally hundreds of thousands of Canadians that need health care have to come to a non-socialized country to get it. Um, how many drugs have Canadian pharmaceutical companies created? I don't know. Not as so many as part of the problem with, Yeah, so part of the problem with that is when you have a place, like you, you could probably say the same for most other industrialized countries, right? Um, so yeah, the, the U.S. is a hub for a lot of those types of things. We are also 10% of your population. So part of me is like, if you weren't doing more and doing better, be like, what the hell's wrong with you guys? You are 10 times our population. Um, sure. Yeah, and, and but the other thing too is like, so for instance, the NHS in Britain, and this is an anecdotal story and this is from about 15 years ago, but um, I have a buddy who is a, is it a type 1 diabetic? Is it like you're born with it? Yeah, it's type 1, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my friend, Dr. Metz, he's a, He's got a PhD in um, communication. Um, He went over to work for Apple Computer in London, and he has an insulin pump. You know, and this is, again, this is almost 15, oh, it's probably 20 years ago now. He had an insulin pump. It looks like a little, if you know what a pager is for the younger kids, you know, and this thing, you know, he would just, you know, eat something, and then he would, you know, tell his insulin pump to, like, do it. I think they're automated these days. At any rate. So he gets over there to England, and he almost dies because they cannot figure out how to give this man insulin. Insulin in a first world country, okay? And so, like, he is trying to get the NHS to understand the the idea of an insulin pump was so foreign. Now, again, these things have been out for, like, 15, 20 years by the time this happened. So they've been out a long time. He literally had all of the doctors in the hospital gathered around him to examine this insulin pump because they had never seen one in person, okay? Because, again, socialized medicine, the plan is, oh, you've got a chronic disease. Let's make sure you die quicker because we don't want to have to pay for that because we have to ration health care. And so, you know, he, he ended up having to inject himself 
um, you know, with, for, with insulin for, I think, almost six months before they were able to get the refills for his insulin pump um, that he was paying for, by the way. This was not free. It's just that England was so far behind in medical technology at the time that a, that a simple thing that we have here in the United States was like circling the monolith for physicians in Britain. It's probably like how in like uh, so, like South Korea and like Taiwan, like how you know they have like cell phones and their technology, like they could probably fly by now, and we still have like you know the crap we have because you know that, I mean that's where everything's like produced. So like they, they have like advanced things that like even in the Philippines, good lord! It's like when my wife got here, like the phones and stuff they had. I'm like, are you serious? Like, is it, is it like a space car? Uh, because they're just so close to like, like you said, like the hub or the industrialized central um, thing of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, here in America, I mean, you know, we're obese and unhealthy, and you know, so medicine's what we gravitate towards. <laughs> um, hey, Chris, I just wanted to talk a little bit about your PTR. Um, you, you might want to seek medical help. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be on a wait list too long. Right, exactly. Yeah, I moved to Canada. I didn't tell you. Um, no, so, uh, yeah, since all the anti-Calvinists are running around talking about how Augustine was a what is called a Manichaean, it's a Gnostic cult from the 3rd and 4th centuries, um, since they're all running around making this ridiculously stupid claim, um, and they don't even know what Manichaeism even is, the joke is on them that, like, one of the things that Manichaeans taught is that physical matter is evil, and so when they pooped, they only pooped pure light. And so uh, kind of a joke on them, you know, because they have no idea what they're talking about. It's just a bunch of just a it bunch never, of stupidity from the Steph version of Christianity. It never oh, ceases to amaze me how much you guys fight amongst yourselves. It, hey, it, hey. It really never I, I don't want to I don't want included in their squabbles. <laughs> I no, I meant I meant you guys in general. Uh, some company excluded, obviously. Um, but yeah, no, it, it never ceases to amaze me. Just the, you know, the, I think one of my favorite <clears throat> arguments that I hear between Christians is the whole kind of once saved, always saved versus conditional salvation. Uh, you know, and the fact that you can lose it and stuff like that. Um, that's, that's the funniest one that I hear people just raging over. And I'm going to take the bait devil. I just sit back with my popcorn. <laughs> Uh, well, why do you have? I, I want to know why he has an electrician coming for his uh, for his car. Like, is it a electric Tesla? Car. Like, it's well, an I, electric I car. That. I mean, is is it? I I know that. I mean, is it a Tesla or like what electrical malfunction did it have? No, no. It, uh, so I have to have a charger installed, right? To charge. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. You don't already have one, or you're getting like the souped up version, like the quick charger? No, no, it's not. Well, it's not. I would never buy a Tesla. Um, but no, it's uh, no, it's just a. So I haven't taken delivery of it yet. It comes in a couple of days. Oh, um, okay. That explains so much more. Yeah. So basically What's the, the charger, yeah, charger getting, I, I don't know if I, you should, uh, it's a Mercedes. Um, oh, so, okay. yes, I didn't know they had an EV. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just uh, like, you know, get the charger installed so that you can then bring the car home and then charge the car. Um, I could, like if I, I probably could have taken delivery a couple of days ago and then just used local charging that they have available. Um, plus I don't drive a ton. It's got a range of about 500 kilometers. Is this, um, is, are, are, is the charger you're getting installed like the two, uh, I don't know how it is there, but like, you know, here we it's have a level, like, it's called a level two, whatever that means. So, so there's it's like level, the souped up fast charger. Well, so there's three levels. My, my understanding is there's three levels. So there's level one, okay. which is basically just plugs in like a wall plug and it'll take you yeah. like four days to charge your car. Uh, yeah. Um, and then there's the level two, which will charge the one that we got in about seven hours. Okay. Um, and then there's the level three, which will do like a charge in like 45 minutes. But for like Is a level three expensive? charger, you no, know, you have to have like special, like I'd have to have my whole house rewired and uh, something brought in special from the street because uh, it, it has to operate on like 400 volts and like you can only get up to 220 in residential. So I'd have to, like it would co probably cost $20,000. Okay. So basically for that, like so. an industrial thing. Exactly. Or, or and like how long places, does it take? Forty-five minutes. How long do you say it takes? Um, yeah. If, if you got the if you got the DC charger, I think it takes like forty-five minutes to charge. Wow. Okay. Uh, Chris, you were about to take the bait on once saved, always saved. Well, I mean, yeah. So I've been doing a deep dive on Finneyism, which is really interesting. This wasn't even a discussion for 
most of the church, um, you know, until Charles Finney reared his ugly head in the 19th century, um, and American Christianity changed forever. And that kind of launched all the JWs and the and the uh, Mormons and all that stuff. Um, well, the Mormons were a little bit before that, but all the Restorationist cults. Uh, Finney was sort of the gasoline on the Restorationist fire. And so when somebody is arguing that you can lose your salvation, they're one of two things. They are either a Roman Catholic um, who has bought into a sacramental theology, or they are a, a Pelagian, like for lack of a better word. They're, they're in a cult called Finneyism, and they are not an actual Christian denomination. But, but this is where, again, there's like zero practical difference, right? So, you know, if someone says, you know, oh, great, you've, uh, you're following Christ. You're a Christian. You are always saved. Um, welcome. And then that person starts doing all kinds of evils and, like, renounces Christ and everything. And then they're like, oh, what? Am I still saved? Am I still saved? That person's going to be like, oh, no, I was mistaken. You were actually never saved. Because if you were saved, there's no way you would live like that. Versus another yeah. group that's like, oh, you have fallen off the path. You've gone wayward, my son. Repent and come back. So I mean, practically, there's no difference. Either everyone's going to say that person seems saved, or everyone's going to say, nope, that person uh, does not seem in a right place with God. Yeah, and that's the type of thing that you hear. Like, I've, I've watched entire debates on stuff like that. Um, like, you know, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll tell you, have whole debates on, you know, once saved versus conditional salvation, soteriology and eschatology, which are my favorite things to kind of listen to. Um, but um, it, it like, I find it because like there's, I think the once saved is the only thing you can back up biblically because there is somewhere in the Bible that says, you know, it's like, if you do this, you will have like present tense, uh, you know, eternal life. So if you have it, then you can't lose, like, is the, or you can't lose it is the argument that I've heard from people. I mean, I think it's like it's all bollocks in the first place. But well, I mean, for that one, if someone, gives me a, if someone gives me a can of soda, I mean, I have a can of soda. I can throw that can of soda away, and then I don't have it anymore. Again, that, that was for that point. Not talking about salvation, but just, just for that specific oh point. Goodness. I'm not saying about salvation, Chris. I'm saying if you give me a can of soda, you're like, Nate has a can of soda. And then I'm like, no, it's I don't want like this can of soda. It's more ontology. Like, okay, once you have a child, you're always a father. Even if your children pass away, you're still father to your children, right? So there's an ontological change that occurs. That's the, that's the point. And that's the point that Phineas missed. And again, I, we're going to do, and Michael, you might find this interesting, the history of Phineasism and who Charles Finney was, the Second Great Awakening, so-called, and all this stuff. I actually started, I actually looked him up, a, actually, yeah, when, when I started doing more of a deep dive into JWs and Mormonism, I actually looked him up a little bit. I have a couple, I actually have a book of his uh, in PDF form that I've never actually taken a deep dive into, but I have a book of his, and it was recommended to me based on someone who came and knocked on my door, like, it was a... One of the local churches got came around knocking on doors, and I told him I was an atheist, and he told me that Charles – he said that Charles Darwin was my god, which just made me laugh. Um, and I told him – I said, well, no, I'm actually – I said, yes, I'm an atheist, but I'm also doing this look at these other things. And his was the first time I'd heard uh, Finney's name. And so I went online and found a PDF and uploaded it. I just never – I just never cracked it. Oh, Michael. Um did we have this conversation? I don't remember um, about uh, Richard Dawkins, PCA on him, coming out in an interview, like saying how you know, turns out, oh, well, Christianity isn't such a bad thing. Did, did we talk about the whole thing, or did you see that interview he did? No, I've not seen it. So, so it's interesting. So, I mean, I will like, if I have my highest possible degree of charitability on, I can I can look at the positive points of any religious system, like things that provide uh, a social network or help to strengthen a family. Like if you have, if you have one whole family, right, that all has the same system of beliefs and they all come together, that could strengthen that family. Like, I'm not saying that there is no good that comes of religion, but, and, and I've not seen the interview. I'm, I'm actually, I like Richard Dawkins from the science perspective. I, I think his science is rock solid. Um, but he says some dumb stuff too. And so I, I like, I don't follow quote unquote, follow what any 
scientist or any, anybody says, like, I'll, I'll look at the science that they do, but any stuff they say outside of that, I, I yeah, I don't care about. Uh, hey, Courtney, what's up? ND, good morning. Morning. Who's the Courtney, my homegirl. Hey. What's up? what's up, D? How are you doing? Good morning. Hey, Courtney, I wanted to say, again, I, I don't think we had a, I didn't think I had a chance to say it uh, the other day when we were chatting, but I really enjoyed our, our discussion uh, that we had back and forth. It was, uh, it was good. I, I took a lot away from it. What was it about? I always enjoy, yeah, no, I always enjoy speaking to you. Um, I think you're very charitable, as you were just speaking of. What was it Courtney, about? Courtney, how often do you enjoy speaking with me? Like on a percentage, percentage basis. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you, Scott. What did you say? So how often do you enjoy talking with me, like on a percentage basis? <laughs> as long as you keep it kosher, I, I enjoy speaking with you. Nate, to answer your record. question, yeah, to answer your question, Nate, we, we kind of, Courtney and I ran the gamut yesterday. We talked about a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure we, I could nail it down to like one thing. We, we ran a pretty wide gamut. Oh, okay. I, uh, I was not here yesterday. I was getting a consultation for my daughter to get braces. So, yay. Chick-ching, chick-ching, chick-ching. Oh, it's You know ridiculous. what? It is not that expensive. It costs as much as a cheap car. It costs as much um, as a cheap car. My daughter, her braces are $109 a month. Yeah, but how much is that over your total? <laughs> yeah, girl. Fact, wait, she, she had it, wait. It's been maybe about a year and some change. It it was like a total of like maybe two thousand, and then um, the uh, insurance pays half. It wasn't even. It didn't seem like a lot. Like yeah, I, I think it's cheaper than it used to be, yeah. for yeah. sure. But it's still pretty expensive, especially with the prominence of how many people have to have it. Yeah, and yeah, kids I mean, want them now. <clears throat> like kids want braces. Like. Like it's a fad or something. Yeah, when we uh, when my kid uh, we got the we got the price and my kid's eyes and mine like popped out of our heads. I'm like, but but wait, um, insurance covers tooth extractions, right? I'm like, those are free, right? They're like, yeah, insurance pays all those. Like like I, I should just not try to joke. Um, and it was a joke, uh, but the the dentist person uh, was like, yeah yeah, they cover that. Why? And then they're like, oh, and and they finally like light bulb went off. My kid's like, wait, what? Like, you're going to get all my teeth taken out? I'm like, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It made me laugh. I don't know. No? No one? Well, no, my, my brain just went to a very bad place. No, no, it makes total sense. I mean, it sounds like something my husband would say. He'd say, oh, yeah, how much does it cost to extract each tooth? Oh, okay, let's do the math. Yeah, it seems like that would be a better route to go. And then, sorry, <laughs> kids, you're going to have to gum it to death. I'm like, can we get those like fake vampire, like, uh, you know, those fake plastic vampire teeth? I'm like, that'll be your teeth now. <laughs> oh, speaking of just vampire kidding, everyone. Teeth, just kidding. I have a tangent story. So I oh. have I have this set of vampire teeth that I got for Halloween, and they're they're ones where basically you 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 stick them in, and then there's a thing you push with your tongue that makes the fangs come down. Um, they're super. I got them from like a special effects place. Um, I have those, and I also I also have white. Uh, contact lenses that I got. So my thing, I always dress up as a, I, I think vampires are cool. I always dress up as a vampire for Halloween, like if we're handing out candy and stuff. And so I put those in and when the kids come up, I smile and then I, and then I poke my tongue and the fangs come down. And if they're little ones, I don't do it if they're little, little ones, but if they're like nine, 10, I do it and they, they freak out a little bit, but yeah, I don't, I don't freak out the three year olds, but it's fun. You know, I was a little conflicted one Halloween um, years and years ago. Um, I actually dressed up as like a zombie priest. And I'm like, I don't know, is that, is that blasphemous? I'm like, because, I mean, it has nothing to do with God. It's like, it's a priest. So, I mean, isn't that inherently kind of blasphemous? So I'm like, well, being a zombie priest should be all right. Anyway, that was a little conflict I had many, many I don't know ago. about blasphemy, but maybe sacrilegious. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, okay, use that word. So, I like, guess it's sacrilegious because, I mean, it's a, it's a priest anyway, which is kind of sacrilegious, right, from my standpoint. So I'm like, well, if it's someone I don't really consider, like, a spiritual authority, then... I mean, I guess it's okay to, you know, turn him into a zombie. I mean, I, w I wouldn't want to, like, dress up as, like, you know, I don't know, like a disciple or something. You're like, no, that's messed up. But, I mean, you know, a, a 
of a sect that I clearly have biblical problems with anyway. I'm like, I don't know. Anyway, that, that was many, many years ago. That reminds me of the movie. Did, did you see Bruce Almighty? Yes. Yeah, so it reminds me of when he's at the party and he's pouring water and it turns into wine in the glass. It kind of reminds me of that. Um, that's fine. Yeah, I, I, I think Chris would say it would only it would only be bad if it was his kind of priest, but if he went as a Catholic priest, I'm sure it would be fine. That's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. I remember watching all of those exorcist movies and the Catholics always being the heroes in all those movies where they had to pull out the cross. And I was like, yeah, yeah, go Jesus. <laughs> to, to now think like the Catholic church is not for us. <laughs> yeah. I, I, have a, I have a poster of the exorcist movie. It's one of, we have several movie posters in our basement where we spend most of our time watching movies and TV and stuff. And uh, one of the, post- like the 24 by 36 poster I have is of The Exorcist. And it's the one that says, you know, the scariest movie of all time, the version you've never seen, the one they re-released maybe, I don't know, 15 years ago. Um, and uh, people say, like, you know, uh, I'm like, I love that movie. It's one of my favorite movies. It's hysterical. Like, because, because none of this stuff is real, I just look at it and I just think it's funny. Like, I just laugh at it. There's, I don't attach any of the symbolism that, anyone who is faithful would attach to us. Look at this is, this is funny. Well, I think there's lots of like, even agnostics that would still get creeped out by like, you know, demon type possession movies because you know, they're like, well, I don't know. Maybe it's real somewhere. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like, unless you're just like the most ardent of ardent, which I know you are, you're like, no, I gnostically claim it, it, none of it is real. Although I can't prove it. So I'll say I can't prove it, but you basically are, are just like, as far as you can get on that edge, um, then, you know, I guess they would take your stance. But I mean, I think, you know, most people on planet earth would still be a little like, ah, you know, I don't want to tempt fate. I don't want to tempt this. I don't know. It's creepy. It weirds me out. Maybe there are ghosts. Like, you know, maybe they don't believe in a God. Maybe they believe in spirits or I I don't know, like something like that. Um, I I think that's why I, I don't know. Was it the scariest movie ever? I mean, um, no, I did it make you jump. No, I, maybe the first time I saw it, like I think it came out in 1973 or something like that. Um, and the first time I saw it, I think it was maybe like the early 80s or something like that. Um, my parents were away. My sisters were like, let's watch this movie. I was sitting there watching it. They were the ones freaking out, putting you know covers over their heads. Um, maybe, but, maybe that's when your atheism started and, and you just didn't know it because something like infected you. No, probably not. Um, but it, it's interesting. So... Um, when you talk about the whole kind of like, you know, these things don't exist and stuff like that, I will share anecdotally. So before I learned about, um, before I learned about bereavement disorder, um, I hadn't really done anything with it before, but after my, after my dad died, which would have been 17 years ago, um, I thought I saw him in my house. Now, of course I didn't, but I thought I saw him in my house. And then I started, then I'm like, I was, I went to one of my colleagues at the time cause I was still, I was a social worker then. I uh, went to my colleagues and said, clearly this didn't happen, but, and he's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. And he, and he, he emailed me a resource on bereavement disorder and it's actually pretty common. So people that will see, uh, they think they see ghosts and stuff like that. It's typically of a loved one, someone that they lost or something like that. It's rarely of a person they've never known, seen or anything else like that that's then that's attached to psychopathy typically um but it's actually fairly common it uh, if you look up bereavement disorder and do a little bit of reading on it it's it's pretty common it happened to me as well and after i read a little bit about it i'm like and then it never happened again isn't it kind of like uh not, not like deja vu but kind of like a, a the a same kind of like quirk thing like that like deja vu like you think you've been there before so it's like the bereavement thing would kind of be like a quick little like like uh, almost like a not a flashback like deja vu but it, you know kind of something in that realm, like you get what I'm saying, it's not deja vu, but I mean, it's like it just happens and it's really quick. And you're like, Did I just see that? And then it's like, Well, no, I didn't see that. Kind of like, Have I already relived this memory? It's like, like you oh, gaslight well, no. yourself, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, no, I've, I, I've, I've more commonly had Vuja Day where I'm convinced I've never experienced this before, <laughs> Courtney. Um, every I think the uh, text you put in the chat, um. 
what's the difference between salvation in the Tanakh and salvation in the uh, New Testament? Well, there's there's semantic ranges for the word, so there's actually no like quote difference. It's just the New Testament, especially Paul's writings, are really heavily focused on uh, salvation, which is that your sins have been forgiven and thus. Uh, you'll be resurrected into eternal life. So there's the semantic range of the word. You see this style of, quote, salvation really fleshed out in like the Psalms, like blessed is the man whose sins God will never count against them, right? And you can kind of follow that line of thought and kind of with your methodology and see that that kind of insinuates that in God, uh, meaning in him forgiving your sins, meaning he doesn't count them against you, you will be, you know, resurrected into eternal life. You will live and see the light of life, right? That's the the point. Then there's like this physical salvation, which is kind of what you see happening out of um, Israel. I mean, out of Egypt with Israel, right? God with a strong arm brought them out of um, a land which they were slaves. And so that's the twofold kind of aspects of what it means, quote, salvation. Um, and salvation colloquially is kind of understood to Jews to be um, the salvation of the whole nation as one. Right. All it's not it's not personal. It's not like me, the Jew to God, my creator. It is our people. It's very it's very um, communal and understanding. And so that's how it's kind of viewed. But Christianity really focuses very heavily on the spiritual aspect of the word salvation. But there's also the same thing that happens with the word justification. You know, you can be considered just right, which comes from the same Hebrew word. You can be considered just and right um, and still be a sinner, meaning have you sinned. But the justification that Paul speaks of is the justification that comes, which God can only give us, meaning God can make us just. That's that imputed righteousness from Christ onto us. And therefore, that semantic range seems to imply that Paul's aspect that he's presenting is the salvation that brings eternal life, which is what he's kind of discussing in Romans 4. Um, but there are different, it's just a range. It's just the way that the word can be used. It could be used literally, the word light, or it could be used literally, or it could be more metaphysically. It just depends on the writer. Awesome. One more question. What is your perspective of the laws are done away with? I know a lot of churches speak about that what is your perspective because i know you come from both sides well it's interesting um when the church says that the laws are done away with okay so let's back this up a little bit so the laws are done away with okay are you a gentile or, or a jew they'll say i'm gentile and i'll say okay so why are you even speaking about the laws being done away with to you as a gentile for which you acknowledge was not even applicable to you from the beginning and they just kind of stand there and they look at me and they go, yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying, right? You're basically asking me, Courtney, why is it that I'm saying laws that never applied to me are now done away with so they, I don't have to do them? And so it depends on the perception of the person that you're speaking to. But again, Paul is speaking of like, there's no command in the Torah that you can do that's going to bring you salvation. There's not one. David speaks of this in Psalm 51. If there was an offering, I'd bring it right to clear my debt against God. And so Paul's main focus in his ministry is there's nothing you can do of your own that will ever bring salvation. Salvation is a gift from God. Whether you keep the law or you don't, there's nothing you can do that will ever, 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 ever bridge the gap between you as the sinner and God who is perfect and just and blah, blah, blah. Insert whatever words you find to be the most edifying to understand how holy God is. Um, so that's kind of my answer, but Jews, Jews agree. Gentiles don't have to keep the law, but for some reason they have vitriol for Paul, whose ministry was mostly to Gentiles. And I'm sure there were some Jews speckled in there, of course, of course, because they lived amongst the Gentiles. That's the point in the book of Acts, whenever, um, they said, surely they will have heard that you've come, um, and you're teaching the Jews not to keep the law anymore and brother don't you know how they're zealous for the law and for christ what what do we say that you've come offer up 
um, for yourself and for others, which was quite expensive, by the way, to do a uh, Nazarite vow, which was him acknowledging that he, in and of himself, still as a Jew, keeps the law, but he's not doing it for salvation. And not only is he paying for himself, but he's paying for other people, which, again, was a very, very expensive thing to do. Um, and so it just depends on what you're asking, the location that you're asking about, if it's Israel or if it's like America. Um, so, yeah, that's my answer. What do you think about that, D? Okay. Yeah. One more question. I think this is so your perspective. What I, I actually kind of like twofold. So, um, what should Gentiles do? Like, what what are the requirements of Gentiles then? Because they just can't be. I believe in Jesus, and you know, faith without works. You know. Yeah. Um. So that was the next question. And the other question is, do you think the New Testament is in is is completely active right now? Because the laws are not written on our hearts, or is that the laws supposed to be written on your heart if you are a Israelite? Okay. Great so. questions. I'll try and be short. Um, what did Jesus say in Luke ten whenever now this is a Jew that's asking him? Okay. So let's consider who's asking him. On an occasion, the expert in the law stood up and to test Jesus. Notice it's a test. Teacher, rabbi, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Notice the question he's not asking. He's not asking, what must I do to draw near to the temple? What must I do to uh, be considered righteous? He's asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Meaning God will give me the gift of eternal life as a son of inherit, meaning uh, someone, a father passes on something to a son. What must I do to inherit eternal life and thus be called sons of God? That's the key. That's the point. Okay. 26, Jesus says, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He's asking, how do you read it? Because of the fact that there's multiple ways to interpret and read. There's semantic ranges. There's ways to understand. There's hermeneutics. All of this is being acknowledged. And words have meaning, but they have meaning to those who say they have meaning. Right? So, he answered, he says, uh, love your Lord, your God, with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind um, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus answered and says, you have answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he just wanted to justify himself, this Jewish man that came up to Jesus. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So this is a question that's going on at this time. Who is the neighbor? And the reason why this question is so, because you have the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai, and they're arguing over who is, they're arguing over many things, but they're arguing over who is my neighbor? Is my neighbor the fellow Jew or is my neighbor the Gentile that's, you know, a street away from me who does not observe the law? And so the question kind of is hung there for the reader to really assess who is my neighbor. And so if if we look in the Hebrew Bible, do we ever see God destroy, ever, God destroy a nation, one outside the land of Israel, um, worshiping other gods, um, for not, one, wearing tassels, eating clean, doing nada, all these other ritualistic things, which are very bound to the worship of the land in and around the temple, or worship of God, excuse me, in the land in and around the temple? The answer is no. A flat out hard no. We never see God go, you know what? This nation is eating pork. I'm fixing to destroy them. I did, gosh, don't they understand that I told them not to eat pork? These stupid Gentiles, why don't they get it? No, we never see God do that. So what happens is we see God destroy nations for no justice, no mercy. Um, many times, some things that could be considered uh, sexual immorality, but it's up to a certain point. It seems as though there's a, there's a lax area there, and then it heaps up and it builds up, but it's in conjunction with other things. Like Sodom and Gomorrah fell. Yeah, but did they fall because of sexual immorality? Well, Ezekiel tells us they fell because of like just ethical reasons. And so God will destroy a nation not for not wearing tassels, not mixing fabrics, you know, doing things, not doing sacrifices, etc., but rather for the way that they treat their fellow brother and sister, i.e., who is my neighbor? 
So it seems as though Jesus wants us to focus on the big 10. And I hate to say the big 10 that gets you in, like the, the statement that the big 10 that gets you in, but that seems to be where Jesus's focus is, which kind of goes in alignment with what you see in Isaiah 42, that that would be his ministry to the Gentiles, right? That he would go out and be a light to the nation. So if you're a light to the nations, and you understand the word light could have implications for resurrection, then in what way do you become a light to the nations in both ministry and resurrection? So it seems as though Jesus wanted the Jews and the, uh, and the Gentiles to focus on loving your neighbor. But then one would say, well, how do I love my neighbor? Which is kind of what he was asking. How do I do that? Well, the Torah can give you help in that, but we find in Romans 2 that Gentiles are inherently doing the things that are written in the law without being told to do them. So if a Gentile is eating pork, but he's taking care of the widow and the orphan, he's actually doing Torah, but he's not doing it because there's a written code that tells him to do it. So is the law written on his heart? Sure. So to answer your other question, <clears throat> is the law written on our hearts yet? I guess it would depend on what you mean by that, because there's always a range of ways to interpret. Sure. I believe if a person dies believing in the message of the New Testament, then law is written on their heart, right? That's the point. And we see Paul and we see Philippians kind of discuss this. And we see um, you're still running the race. Like, don't give up. Don't don't just, well, you know, this is like a Calvinist argument, right? Um, well, the Cal the oh, we left. I was going to say, hopefully he can tell me if I'm wrong here. Um, but if that is so, well, if, if Calvinism is true, then why should we preach gospel at all? Right. So it's like this borderline walk, this fine line. So the answer seems to be that God wants us to be both heavenly and earthly, but don't be so earthly minded that you're no good minded Earth, or don't be so heavenly minded that you're not earthly minded. In other words, you should continue to live your life, a decent person, do the things that God has required you to do, uh, be a good person, etc. Justice, mercy, sacrifice and sacrifice doesn't mean slaughtering an animal in this aspect. And your, your God will give you your eternal reward based on that. And you can see that in Isaiah 56, that the people who bind themselves to the Lord God, but are not called Israel, they're not Jews, but they bind themselves to God and salvation comes to them, which is quote, God's righteousness as it's identified. Paul just calls it God's righteousness because he's looking back at the Hebrew Bible. But in the Hebrew Bible, the prophets just call it his, meaning God's, his righteousness. And his righteousness is always attached to God's mercy. And that's always attached to the promise of David. Always. Let so, hope that jump in. Uh, Yeah, in reverse order. Um, what does it mean the law is written in our hearts? Is that for Gentiles or whatever? Yes, Paul makes the case. That's why people were instinctively doing what they knew they should be doing. What was in line with God. Uh, you know, it was in line with the law, even though these people didn't have the law. So he's like, that's that's what it means. You know, we don't follow the law of Moses, but we follow the law of the spirit and the law is written in their hearts. That's why people in some foreign land just naturally were doing stuff that people who had the law were striving to do because it was written on their hearts. Um, as far as what do you need, like two categories, right? What should you do as a Christian? What must you do for salvation? What must you do for salvation? Romans 10, 9 and 10. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. So repent and believe. That's what you must do for salvation. What should you do as a Christian? Everything that's been said in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> you know, you should keep the Ten Commandments. You should, uh, I mean, you know, like don't murder, don't cheat, don't lie, don't bear false witness, stuff like that. Like you should learn about Christ. Jesus says in John 8, 31, to the Jews who believed in him, remain faithful to his teachings and you're truly his disciples. Um, why on earth would you not do what Jesus did? Why would you try to do the things Jesus didn't? So you should do lots of stuff. Um, you should not do evil. You should do good. You should overcome evil with good. Like everything Jesus does, you should do that. Um, is it necessary for salvation? No. Uh, can you just repent and believe and sit on a log and do nothing else the rest of your life and be saved? Yes. Should you do that? Well, no, because the Bible says faith without works is dead. So do you do works for salvation? No. Uh, can you can you help? Can you can you not do good works as a Christian? No, you can't help it. Like I dare someone to try. Like you're going to do good stuff. I mean, even if you really really try, maybe you can you know um, be a rebellious uh, prodigal son for a while. 
But if you're truly saved and truly have a confession that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says you have the Holy Spirit living with you, guiding you into truth and righteousness. So if you try and be like, okay, Jesus is Lord, um, and then do nothing else, eventually you're just not going to be able to help it. You're going to do good stuff, not to save you because you are saved, which gets into the whole argument. But yeah, so the, um, yeah, I, I think I agree with Courtney. Um, what, what must you do for salvation? Repent and believe. What should you do as a disciple of Christ? Lots of stuff. The stuff Jesus does. See, I think the problem is so many people want to know, right, whether other people are saved. They're like, I've got to be able to prove whether this guy is saved. Why? It's not your problem. But i got to be able to prove. <laughs> you, know? you know what I'm saying? That, but yeah, that's how everybody to hell on clubhouse so there's everybody it's so like i always tell people that's above my pay grade listen i'm just worried about me myself and i my family and raising my children right so that they can be good stewards of the earth which implies that they're also going to you know be interacting with other humans that may or may not agree with their position so that's my main focus but i know that christ is my salvation point blank end of discussion um but the question is always, but, 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 but where's the line in the sand? Where's the, and, and to me, that just tells me, like, I'm hearing me, my works, me, my works, me, where, me, me, me. So, so I'm about to give you, I'm about to give you that. So the verse that says, well, in my background noise, you're. All right, so, you know, I think it's the verse in, is it James, John, or Revelation? Those who endure up to the end. What is your perspective on that? Well, remember, we kind of already covered the differences in salvation. Those who endure to the end will be saved. What does saved mean if you have the semantic range of the word? You have the literal saving. Some people will literally be, quote, literally fleshly saved, but not in the way that you're thinking, not in the way that we're just discussed. That's just saved. Um, like earth, so endure you know? to the end means the end of time? No, not by, like if the end of time is coming in 4,000 years from now, not that I will literally be here. It's a message to those in that specific time. Do you understand? Okay, so it's like the difference, but it's like when Joel is quoted, right? Joel, what is it, two is quoted, right? It's a message to those specific people of that specific time in which Joel 2 is relating to. It doesn't mean those who endure to the end, meaning salvation wise, there's nothing you can do to fill the gap from. Like Christ filled it all the way. He filled it. There's you and then there's God on the other side and Christ fills it 100%. You don't fill the 10 and Christ covers the 90, which is something that a lot of people in Torah think. They're like, my work plays a role. No, it doesn't. It just makes you filthy. Sure, you should do good <laughs> things. You know, you should do good things. I'm not saying don't do the good things. Do Be the blameless. Be the good. Be whole. But don't pretend as though because you're blameless and whole and you're, quote, righteous of your generation, then that equals you played a role in your salvation. Because blessed is the man who God doesn't count his sins against him. Therefore, God is a gift. God gave you a gift that he doesn't count your sins against you, meaning you sinned. <laughs> you know, so it's like everyone is so focused on their own centered works that they just drop Christ. They drop God. They're like, I can do this on my own. But the only reason they want to do it on their own is because Christ is there to, quote, catch them. Because it's subconsciously they know that if they sin, they're not going to fall into the pit of fire. Because Christ is there, right? So they're like, I'll just keep doing what I want to do. So for me, when people imply this, I'm always like, that tells me either you don't understand what the scriptures are teaching or your heart posture is wrong. Because if you're so concerned about, like, the man, right, that was trying to test Jesus and he wanted to justify himself, he just wanted to figure out what he was allowed to do and what he wasn't. What can I get away with? What can't I? And for me, I'm going to strive to walk as though Christ is not my protector, not my savior, although I know he is. And I'm going to fail because I'm human. I'm in flesh. But I'm going to pretend as though I'm running this race all alone because I care so much about what my creator thinks about the way I behave. And that's what matters to me most. And that's what I'm instilling into my children. And if I never want my children to go, well, that means I have to work for my salvation. Absolutely not 100% you're in inaccurate. So that's yeah, my it, answer all the time. Yeah, kind of like, you know, instead of like, like to, 
to sidestep the whole debate, like, you know, once saved or you have to work to keep it, even though technically, you know, the right Christian answer is you don't have to work, but it sure looks like you're trying to work to, to just avoid the whole argument. It's like, instead of, because it always goes on the line, right? Like all, all these religious discussions get to like, you know, if it's not rape and murder, it's always like, what's the worst I can be? How many people can I murder and get to heaven? It's, it's like always extreme. <laughs> um, so it's like, if you just want to sidestep the whole thing, instead of like, you know, thinking how, how, how close can I get to line and be saved? Just think how far away from that line can I get? Like, just, I don't know. Like, if, if like, are you believing Jesus is, you know, Jesus is Lord and believing, you know, he rose from the dead and he's the one giving you eternal life and your salvation. Like you're good. If you're also like, you know, clubbing baby seals on the weekend, maybe stop that. I, I just think it's something important that should be mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. Courtney, uh, uh, invoked Chris's name and Chris would probably just say, Courtney, you're wrong. I think she said Calvi. <laughs> which I'm fine. Yeah, but no, no, I think, well, no, and then she was hoping that Chris would be here to, to give his two cents, and he wasn't, and I just think Chris would have said you're wrong. So. Well, I do know the answer to that. So I, I know, um, you, you know, the question was, why do Calvin and Stephen evangelize? Great question, because Jesus tells them to, right? So it's like, well, why do I get baptized? It's not a requirement for salvation, because Jesus tells you to, and you want to be obedient to Christ. So for, like, the, the I, I guess, um, regular Calvinists, they would say, well, look, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. But, you know, Jesus tells us to, you know, go tell people about him and share the gospel. So we're out there doing it. We don't know God's plan. We don't know uh, who's going to be saved or who the elect is. All we know is God, Jesus says do it. So we do it. Um, Hyper yeah. Calvinists, though, which they would consider heretics, would say, no, we don't evangelize because, you know, like you said, like whatever's going to happen is going to happen. So we just ignore the Great Commission. But that's why other Calvinists consider them heretics because they're like directly blatantly defying what Jesus says. It's like, well, how are you going to be a follower of Christ if you're like disregarding the things your master says? So um, yeah. that, that's the answer. They do it because, Maybe they're, it's because they're not part of the elect. Well, this, the same, this, the same thing happens like kind of in the Torah community. It's like, well, if it's going to be so, then, then why even, you know, what's the point? So that's why I was saying um, people had the same criticism of Calvinism as, you know, well, what are you even doing? What are you evangelizing for? There's no point. Well, there is. Courtney, I, I asked, I asked, uh, on Clubhouse, I asked a Jewish person, I asked them, how are you guys being a light to the Gentiles? You know, because, you know, that's in their well, door. They're, like they're, no, no, they're, and, actually, it's not. The, if they ever. And he was like, I don't have to tell you. <laughs> no, I'm saying, well, no, here's the thing. Is it, it. I know people, and I've said this too, you know, I'm guilty of just like repeating common statements, but all of the passages in the Hebrew Bible, which say, be a light to the nations is a messianic passage. It's about Jesus. It's not about the Jews. Yeah. They don't proselytize. They can they shy away from it. No, 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 no. They, they used to. That's not even what I'm saying. Um, I'm saying the passages, which tell them like in Deuteronomy, that people should look to them and say, oh, what a wise nation. Now that's about the Jews. But whenever, when it says like in Isaiah that you're going to be a light to the nations, that is a messianic chapter. Because that word light is inference of resurrection. It has nothing to do with evangelizing, um, the Jews evangelizing. So yeah, but like it, the clubhouse thing, like, yeah, in Judaism, I mean, they they don't proselytize. I mean, I'm not talking about, like, ancient times or, or whatever you're talking about. But no, I know, I'm Courtney's familiar. Clubhouse. Yeah, I'm very familiar. I, I mean, not Courtney, uh, these things. These thing. What I'm saying, though, is whenever, when D asked them that question, D, uh, you said, how are you doing what your scripture says to be a light uh, to the okay. nations? They should, right, they right. should know, they should reply and say, well, those passages are not about us. They're about the Messiah. If you ever hear one say that, you got to get that on record, because then that implies that the Jews can't be a light to the nations, that the job to be a light to the nations was only for the Messiah. Yeah, I got, you know, we shouldn't have to tell you. I mean, that's something that is there, but... It, I, and I was just, it was a very, um, 
deflection yeah. of a conversation. Yeah, they won't they won't, they won't answer. But at minimum, they're supposed to be a quote wise nation, so that all the Gentiles would look and say, "Oh, what a wise nation that their God is so close to them." Because you got to remember, all the other gods were quote far off from them, whereas Israel had a God in their midst. And that God could be in their midst with not being physical. You couldn't see it. There was no idol. There was no stick. There was no stone. There was nothing to represent him. He was able to save you even when you were in the depths of the ocean far off away from the land of Israel. So what a wise nation in Deuteronomy, it says. That's what's supposed to draw people to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the Jews. That's the call for the Jews. Hey, Steph, Jesus wrote a dinosaur. Oh my gosh, that works so quick. Yes, yes, good morning. I, I, I don't want to abuse it, but I mean, it's been like months and months since I've, I've used that. So I figured uh, figured would get you up here to join the conversation since you've I mean, it makes me by so rarely. Time. So what's up? How's life? Hanging in there, man. Hanging in there. How are you, Nate? I'm doing good. Apparently, I've been I've been misfiring on all cylinders this morning. I just I just like mistook these points. Um, you know, earlier I told um, I, I made a political oops with CEO's question. I, I'm just like not firing on all cylinders today. <laughs> I really have to think extra about things. I don't know. I, well, oh, that's, that's why I had I had a point. night I, I had like a bad dream about like this giant tarantula type spider last night. And like I knew I was dreaming, but I also couldn't stop the dream. And it was like this nasty, like grow, like a, like a tarantula, like four times the tarantula size. And I'm like, I don't think it's gonna hurt me. And then I'm trying to like invent ways that I can go like get this thing out of my house, like you know, getting like a bubble suit or something. And I'm like, if I can invent this in my dream, why can't I just wake up? <laughs> Maybe that's why. <laughs> that sounds I'm doing all right. <laughs> messed up. I've never had a dream like that. I've never had a dream where I'm aware I'm dreaming, ever. Hmm. Is that like a common <laughs> experience? Because I heard, uh, okay, yeah, I had heard apparently, that if you become common. aware that you're dreaming, then you can be more, you know, control. You can have better control of the dream. I don't know. Never had that. That, happen. that, that is true. It didn't happen until I. I don't know. Maybe. <clears throat> Uh, maybe several years ago, 10 years ago or something. I don't know. Whenever I, I became aware that was a thing. So I don't know if it has to do with like REM sleep or different sleep patterns where, sorry if that's making noise. I'm having a hamburger for my breakfast. Um, anyways, um, but I don't know if it has to do with different sleep patterns or different levels of sleep, but yes. So there have been times when I started dreaming and having like really like creepy dreams. I'm like, wait, um, I'm just going to give myself superpowers. And I'm like, oh, like, you know, this thing is happening, like whatever it was, or I was like, I was like following, uh, following and like the center of the earth and the earth was following me up. I'm like, wait, I'll just, I'll just like make myself stand on top of the earth and fly. And then I'm like, oh wait, the atmosphere is crushing me and or something like that. Or I'm still following or the atmosphere is burning up. I'm like, wait, it's my dream. Like finally I just put myself like captain um, or what was the guy's name? Like, um, 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 oh my gosh, Dr. Strange, like, like out in the middle of the universe. And then give myself the ability to not freeze and breathe. I'm like, I can do that. And then I, I wake up. But yes, it is a thing. I don't I don't know what it's called. If Michael was here, maybe he'd have some insight. But yes, so I, I try to like tell my kids that. I'm like, look, if you ever like have a bad dream and you're like somehow aware that you're dreaming enough, just like give yourself superpowers and then like you know beat whatever monster you're fighting or whatever. That's all I got. Okay. I have a biblical question <laughs> about dreaming. Um, so we see <clears throat> dream Famine interpretation for seven years. What? Famine for seven years. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, perfect. End of question. Uh, we see in the Bible that, you know, that dream interpretation was actually like a vocation. You could have this, you could have this like, you know, job. Um, but I have a question. Okay, I have a friend who, and as you guys know, I'm not, I mean, a, a slight wind could blow me off of my cessationist position, but I'm generally cessationist and not charismatic by tradition and all of that, right? I have this friend who like constantly, constantly, she's she's a believer. She's very, you know, well-educated, went to Bible college. She's been a believer her whole life, da 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 Okay, her salvation is not in question. She is constantly looking to interpret dreams and not in like a new agey way. She's just sort of always looking for like, what is the Lord trying to tell me here? And I, okay, this always spooks me a little bit because I have, some really crazy dreams that I just wake up super stressed or freaked out. 
last night I dreamed that someone was making me like drink this thing and I didn't want to drink it anyway, whatever. So what is with dream interpretation when are dreams important? Because I always a hundred percent of the time assume that they're not. And uh, what do you guys think? Well, let's start by the cessationist thing. I don't think like usually when people talk about continuationism, continual continuationism and cessationism, it's in regard to like the the gifts. So dream interpretation is not yes, one of these. Prophetic, wouldn't it? Like that would fall I, under prophecy. You'd have to read yeah. that in. But on but on its face, like you know, uh, tongue, healing, like all, all these other things, like if you want to say it's prophetic, you'd have to read that into it. So that would be the first thing you have to do. Um, I, I would I would stop there and be like, no, we're not going to say dreams has to do with continuationism or cessationism um that's like a whole different category uh, but even if you went down that way i'd be more inclined to say dreams are like um what was it in the in the last days like you know your um daughters will sons and daughters will have dream, or visions and your old men will dream dreams like i i would relegate it to that more than anything but yeah i, I wouldn't put that in the same world as continuationism but that that would be the first point uh i i would make but um it sounds like courtney was going to say something Yeah, it's just a characteristic of prophecy. Um, there's like a, a six-fold type of, I don't want to say ministry, but like characteristic. Five-fold ministry? Yeah, well, no, it's like six-fold with regards to prophets or prophecy. I've never heard six. I've always heard five-fold. No, no, no. Anyway. I'm not saying, yeah, I'm not saying like, um, it's just that the characteristics of a prophet or one who prophesies uh, the interpretation of dreams. So, okay. So it, Courtney is saying that it does probably fall under continuationism, but like, this is such a thing in the church, right? So in my tradition, we don't have people coming up and asking for dream interpretation. So when I was exposed to this friend who's like constantly looking for meanings in her dreams, or Kevin is even a much, you know, lower example of saying that he has a dream that he believes was prophetic. He just said that in the comments and he had it a few years ago. So like, what, what is that? What's going on there? Well, I mean, I, 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 I mean, uh, well, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, if something like that happened, I would look for a spiritual significance and be like, I don't know, God, are you trying to tell me something? Maybe pray about it, think about it for a while. And, but I mean, I, I don't think there's anything like, like how, how big is it going to be in your friend's life? Like what kind of, is she having like apocalyptic dreams or like, oh, I had a dream and I think God wants me to take this job or I want to, I don't know, pray about yeah, it. Yeah, it's think stuff about like it. that. Yeah. Right. So, so analyze it, but don't put more weight than it's worth. Like if it's for, if, like, if it's from God, great. If it's not, whatever. But if it's just mundane, run-of-the-mill stuff, like, oh, remember that friend you haven't talked to? Maybe you should call him. Call him. Maybe it's from the tacos you ate last night that made you think about that. Maybe it was no, from okay. God. All I right. mean, She'll have dreams, and she's looking for guidance. So this is my friend who just went through yeah. that oh, horrific divorce well, I was, with I was, that pastor. Yeah, I, was, I, was I was trying to get to that. But, right. So I mean, the, the, the point is, what kind of guidance do you need? Like, it's not going to be more – like, it's not going to be – significant unless you're talking about like apocalyptic dreams and i'd say just read your bible but um yeah like like dream interpretation it's weird man like i, I would say your friend is like getting into territory that is akin to people like getting pet projects in the bible and before long i'm not saying your friend's gonna do this but like other people like before long they're like yeah jesus is my savior and then they're like the earth is flat you must believe this no salvation only comes by way of jesus by way of the flat earth and the firmament it's like you have lost the plot so I think more than anything, if you think it's from God, great. Get some kind of spiritual meaning that's not going to be earth-shattering um, based on this level of dream. And just take it for what it is. Don't, like, if you start analyzing it too much and you are like have, like, a murder board that you're stringing up things. Like, I had this dream on Tuesday. I had this dream at Wednesday at 3 a.m. And you're, like, trying to force the issue. One, you're going to come up with a self-fulfilling prophecy. And two, um, even – you're – like, stop looking at the uh, – focus on jesus that's the point so like i think like talking about the nephilim that's fine i like it nephilim's great um but if i really went down this rabbit hole and i'm like i've uncovered the 4.5th version of the book of enoch let me tell you about the secret hidden truth i've discovered and you need to believe this like your salvation hangs in the balance it's like bro just believe in jesus okay yeah I, go ahead courtney I just think a lot of females, especially, fall prey to stuff like this. Um, they're they're like, oh, I had a dream. And females are just kind of naturally inclined to try and find meaning in <clears throat> things, whereas guys are just like, oh, wait, what? Something happened? <laughs> you know, they're very centered 
they think very deeply about specific matters, but they don't necessarily notice like the stove is on and, and not all men, but this is kind of like generalizing. Um, it seems to be that when women like have dreams, they want to find a place for them to root that somewhere. And I find this is very prominent in women. Um, and I think it's like, okay, great. What's it going to do for you though? And if you're searching for God in your dreams, because you feel like you're so far away from God and that you don't know how to live your life without interpreting these dreams, then I would say you need to get closer to God by just studying your Bible because he's already given you the map of how to live your life without dreams. So there are people in this world that walk and never, ever, ever have a dream that's prophecy from God. So does, has God left them hanging that they don't know how to live life? No, of course. There's the way to live life is in the Bible, right? The way to continue and serve God. You don't have to have dreams to get close to God. So I feel like people that are searching for that are people that are trying to force God's hand to do something because they don't feel close to God for some reason. They're like, oh, I've got to have, I've got to have this same, I got to have this gift so I can feel close to God. Otherwise, what does God want from me? Well, read the Bible. He'll tell you. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. <laughs> yep. okay. Thank you, that Courtney. Makes sense. So I yes. So I'm. Gonna How did you not get that from the Nephilim comment? Go on. What? I understood what you both said. Okay. Okay. Just, I'm gonna give go a couple on. different examples. So I have this this one friend that I've already mentioned who like will follow certain. So she and she has sort of allegorical dreams, right? So she had a dream that she and her husband were a light on a hill, and then a month later they bought a recording studio and they decided because of her dream to make it a nonprofit and start a ministry, that kind of thing, right? So that is strange. And then, and she's sort of seeking. Then I know a guy on Clubhouse who is saying something maybe more like Kevin is saying that years ago, he had a dream about the Ukraine Russia conflict, but it didn't make sense to him what it was until it started. And now he's absolutely certain that that's what that dream meant six years ago. And he's not, he's like, he doesn't need to do anything with it. He's just sort of shocked that he had this awareness of whatever. And then there are dreams like <clears throat> my mom, my mom is blind, right? And so she found out in, late in her teens that she was going to lose her vision and her, she was losing her vision, vision throughout college. And then I think I've told you guys about this dream that she had where, you know, she everything was fading. And then this uh, man was suddenly clearly visible to her, a sort of nondescript man, but he was the only thing that she could see. And he said, I'm with you. And then the dream ended and she woke up and she's like, that was a dream from the Lord. Like there's no prophecy in there. She just felt like that was Christ saying that, she was going to be okay. Right. So there's all these different layers of like how much, yeah, I guess I'm wondering how different people put meaning into this and how much we ought to pay attention to it. I'm going to be honest. Anybody comes to me and says, I have a dream. The world's going to end, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to say, thanks for telling me your story, but I'm going to continue to just live my life. You know what I mean? And I know that sounds yeah. really, I don't mean to sound insensitive, but like dreams typically, um, or for the person to confirm or deny something, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's meant for me. Because again, God, you know, has people that walk this earth uh, that will never have a prophetic dream. So it's just people are trying to force something that maybe isn't so. I have dreams all the time. Look, I've had a dream once where I'm in my grandmother's old property and like I, it starts raining. It's really dark and I I'm, the rain feels really slimy and weird. And I look up and it's a giant wolf slobbering all over me. So I don't know, maybe that means the lion, or I mean, the wolf and the lamb will lay down together and Isaiah 11 is going to happen in the future or something. Like, I mean, I just, people try and add meaning to things that maybe there's no meaning. And if I tell you, if God really wants you to do it, he'll do it. He'll continue to give you that message and then he'll confirm ways that you will know that this message is meant to be for people. But here's what I think people do. They go, hmm, I can make a living off of this. So let me use this to somehow make a living. And it's unfortunate because it's the same thing you see in the book of Acts, I believe it is, where the guy's like, oh, look, this Holy Spirit thing that y'all got, let me get some of that so that I can turn it into a ministry and heal people and make a living. So that's kind of my answer. And let's get to some other uh, people real fast. And, and I just want to say, yeah, I, I agree with Courtney on that. And uh, that being said, ask your friend what your, your friend, me, uh, giant spider dream means and also i think that's dangerous because um if she has a dream thinking that you know now i have to buy this studio and turn it into a nonprofit, how is she going to judge that 
she's going to automatically judge that on whether it succeeds or fails. And then by what metric does it succeed or fail? So even if it were a dream from God, like Courtney says, if such a thing happened, it's you're going to get confirmation, probably in the scripture and prayer when you're lucid and awake. But um, even if such a thing were to happen, what if the thing uh, gets shut down and she's like, oh, it wasn't from God. But I don't know. Let's just say it was. And, you know, you were only using your own intellect and your own mind to, like, force things to happen. And you're like, well, it wasn't from God because it failed um, when it could have been God for some completely other reason. Or, oh, it succeeds. This is from God. Um, even though it has so much, so much success, you're judging it on it must have been from God because it's successful. And it's so successful you get tons of money, spend it on bad things, walk away from the faith, and ruin your life. Well, it clearly wasn't from God um, just because it was successful. Uh, so I would, I would say there's a lot more to it than that, but I, I agree with what Courtney said. Uh, Kevin, what's up? You're next. Oh, no, just that uh, I came on stage when you guys were talking about it. Um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know if mine's were more so prophetic. It's just that um, when she talked about dreams, I mean, I, I did have a real weird, weird dream uh, back in 2009. Um, I wrote it down as soon as I woke up and, uh, I did find some things significant with the years later. Um, never had a dream like that since, uh, I really don't know what to think of it at this point. Um, other than I think it was pretty cool, but, um, you know, but I'm, I was just, you know, witnessing that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it is possible for people to have dreams even now. Yeah, I would just, I mean, I mean, if you think like that happened or, you know, there's some stuff I've had that I'm like, I don't know, is that a warning from God? Is it something? Is it my pizza I ate before bed? Um, I would just file it away for safekeeping. I'd be like, hey, if there's ever a time where I need to recall this, keep it in the back of my head. Um, Saint, what's up? Yeah, I would just say on this topic, we always find there's always people who go in the gutter too far on both sides. So like some people say, no dreams, that's demonic. And then other people are starting up schools and they're starting to teach people, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I, be I believe 100% that, that they're true. And I just think it's wise for, even if you do have that, you if you're having dreams and stuff, you should have somebody above you um, that you're walking through it with so you don't start going, going nuts. But God bless you. Oh, good to see you. Yeah, you too. I, I mean, the most, I, I think the most biblical way that this scenario would play out, I have a dream. I'm not sure if it's from God or not. I file it away for safekeeping. But a couple days, a couple weeks later, someone's like, I had the craziest dream or I had the craziest experience. And I'm like, wow. And I maybe don't blurt out that I had the same thing, but I'm like, that's interesting. And then maybe something else happens. And um, maybe I'm reading Bible verses and come across it and you know, all these could be my subconscious, like leading me to that verse, even though, because I know what it says, I've read it a hundred times. And then someone else would be like, oh, and I had this experience the other day. And they'd be like, I, I don't even know what to make of that. And be like, yeah, no, I had a dream that was kind of along those lines. And maybe this tidbit of advice could be useful for you. Oh, thank you so much. Do you think that was from God? I can't say, but if that helps you, great. I mean, that's kind of how I see like a, a maybe a non-crazy version of that going. Well, um, what, what I did was, um, so, um, the way my dream happened is, uh, it, it was, uh, it was raw information, uh, looking at how I, that's what I would call it, raw information. I just wrote it down. And then I think years later I have learned something new and I think I told a group of people about the dream and they said, well, you studied this recently. You just learned this. Why not apply that? And so I kind of looked at it and, and it started to make sense. And then I think like eight years from there. I gave, I told it to another group of people and they said, well, you just learned this. Why not look at this? And then it made even more sense. So it, it was just one of those things where when I first had the dream, I had no idea. It, it was no, like, it wasn't prophetic. It wasn't like anything about a war, nothing. It's just raw information. Like, you know, in, in the weird, you know, how do I describe it? Um, it? It wasn't like a dream. You know what I mean? It was just like somebody showing me something. And I just woke up. Can you tell us like, what it right? was? Yeah, so um, this was like 2009, um, 2009, 2010, around that time. Um, I was with uh, a friend of mine by the name of James. And we were doing some really, you know, hard studies on the temple and, you know, trying to find out God's temple, this, that, and the other. And I remember, like, 
keep myself kind of abstinent, like just like not, you know, put my mind in anything messed up or anything like that. And pretty much asking the Lord, you know, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? And one night I go to sleep and uh, I have this dream uh, or source. And it's just like, it's, I'm in the, just, it's just black. Like the TV's off. Like that was the dream. Like it was just black, the TV's off. And then uh, these blocks uh, fly from over my head and kind of line up in front of me. And all of these blocks are like huge. Like they're like the size of the, the bricks you see, like um, like yeah, the, the Egyptian pyramids are made of, right? Like size like that. And it had numbers etched in them. And these numbers were uh, five, seven, sixes, and nines, right? Just a bunch of five, seven, sixes, and nines, right? And they started stacking up and building a wall. And as I'm watching this wall getting built, um, so imagine just like a black, uh, like imagine uh, the best way I could describe it is imagine like a, um, a, you're outside, but everything's black, the ground, you can't, there's no distinction between air and, and, and the ground. And you just see these bricks just flying over your head and just getting lined up in the, in the wall. And they have these, these numbers, five, seven, sixes and nines. And while I'm watching this happen and it was done and it was just a single wall that was just built there, I'm looking at this wall. And these random numbers on it, but it's the same numbers. It's nothing deviates from these four these four numbers. Uh, a hand comes out, like the hand, the hand from what I recall in the dream is probably like the size of like a dinner plate, like a, it was a pretty big hand. Um, and it it grabs my right shoulder, and uh, I felt the face that was probably like the size of like uh, if I could uh, the way it felt, it felt like the size of like three basketballs, like that size, the volume size of three basketballs or something like, it's just a big face. I didn't see the face, but it, you could just feel, you know, somebody's on your shoulder and you can kind of feel them breathing on you. And it just went in my right ear, like, like with his voice that sounded like a woman and a man's voice. And it just simply said, one, two, five, one, three, leave it. And I woke up. That was it. That was a dream. What is it? One, two, five, one, three, lead it. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Yeah. Oh. Uh -huh. Leave it. Yeah. <clears throat> so I right there, felt... I would think, yeah. So right there, that makes me think, I don't know. How do you know if that's from God or not? I can't say what you can say. If you had anything, uh, if you ever come across one, five, whatever, whatever, um, I don't know, lotto ticket or something. If you ever come across that, I'd be like, you know what? Yeah. I don't know if that dream was from God or not. I'm just going to play it safe and leave it. <laughs> Well, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't think anything of it. In fact, I, I told yeah, yeah. it to a lot of people around me, and they're just like, "Oh, maybe it's lottery numbers. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's that." And nothing. So, I think about six years or so passed by. Um, I, I'm studying Hebrew, and as I'm studying Hebrew and I'm learning how they count in Paleo Hebrew, I'm learning this because I'm trying to study the ancient Israelites and how they dealt with things and everything like that. And I told a, a dream to a group of people. And they said, well, why don't you uh, use what you've learned? And I said, okay. So I wrote it down. I, I wrote down a one, two, five, one, three. I wrote down five, seven, sixes, and nines. And I uh, applied the the way that ancient Israelites would have counted and used uh, their language. And um, uh, the one, two, five, one, three was a left bet, hey, a left gamel, right? And the five, seven, six is hey, Zion, vav, teth, right? And when I wrote out uh, the one, two, five, one, three, with the Hebrew that I learned, uh, it was Aleph Bet Hey Aleph Gemel, which means strong house behold strong gathering. That's what it said. Strong house behold strong gathering. And I said, whoa. And then I put the five, seven, sixes, and nines, and it says, behold food, security, and containment. And I said, okay. And it seems to make sense, but it was just like weird. Um, but one thing I didn't consider is that all the numbers are actually divisible by three. Um, I found that nine is divisible in it, three is divisible in it, 12 is divisible in it, right? So if you took five, seven, six, and nine, um, I think that equals out to 27, right? And if you took one, um, uh, see, five, one, three, I think that equals to 12. So the so well, the five, seven, six is not actually equal to twenty-seven. The first five set numbers equal to twelve. All is divisible within one another, and that that that, that was real to me later. So it, it's not anything I'm putting money on it. Like man, that, I got to receive a, a, a dream from job, uh, God. I just simply say it was it was weird. This is the dream I had when I learned Hebrews six years later. Uh, this is the understanding I got 
in a sentence form and calculating the numbers together, everything was divisible. And I was just like, well, that's, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty cool. Okay. I have a question. Do you have any opportunity in your life to move to upstate New York? Uh, <laughs> no, because, all right. Well, one, two, five, one, three is also a zip code near me. So that's just weird. Oh, yeah, there you go. Steph, and six years, yeah, and six is. years later, Steph tells you this, so you move there, and then six years later, coincidentally, <laughs> that adds up to six, six, six. Oh, oh no. yeah. I, I, so, so I would just, I, I mean, and, and then I want to get the mole, and then I have to run. I wish you guys would get here earlier. But um, so uh, things like that, like how, I mean, how it's, goodness, I'm gonna channel my inner Chris for a minute. You know, the God doesn't whisper thing. I think there's something to it on this. It's like, it could be an incredibly elaborate like strung out over years thing but i also think could you not have i don't know been spiritually i, I know you were i don't mean you i mean you whoever people go off the deep end uh you know they could have been so much more spiritually edified by just reading their bible or praying over the time and i, I know you were anyway so i'm not talking about you you uh kevin but yeah by the time you have to like do numbers and then like you know divide and like all this other stuff it's like and then, you know what I found? If I turn a calculator upside down and punch in these numbers, it spells hello. Um, I don't know. For me, it just seems like God is, you know, God is not um, that that hidden. And if it was, uh, yeah. So, I mean, while, while I don't discount the possible, like, spiritual dreams or spiritual meaning or even a complete mundane meaning that you can, that dream that you can pull some sort of spiritual significance out of, even if it's not God trying to give you a dream. Um, I, I would just say, I mean, it kind of sounds like you, right? Like you're just like, oh, file away for safekeeping. And ah, that's interesting. Maybe someday, maybe someday. Um, but if you're, if someone was really trying to like govern their life on something like that, I'd say, no guys, that's sounding like way too close to like some, some weird, like new agey manipulate the universe, numerology type thing. I'd be like, God is not that hidden. <laughs> like if God wanted to give you something, first of all, it's probably going to be in the Bible. Um, anyway, that, that would be my, my take. And it sounds like that's your take too, Kevin. Um, so, I mean, I, I would say, sure, that's interesting. Like, that's interesting. But I, I don't think I, I would just kind of hold that in reserve and not really try to force some prophetic meaning out of it or something. But that's my two cents. But, Mo, you haven't said anything yet. Do you want to terrorize Steph for a few minutes? <laughs> no, what, I would what? love to terrorize Steph. But <laughs> Get out of here. I haven't seen you guys in a little while, so I, I got to be nice. I, I know. Mo, how have you been? How's that um, praying with dreams? your face on the carpet going? Anything? Oh, you know what? Um, yeah, I found a couple more things in the carpet. So I think I mean, it's working. There you go. That's the Lord's I found a contact plan. lens that uh, a friend of mine lost. Have you taken to praying? No. Um, Steph said I could find... I had shag carpeting in the basement of this house. And, uh, is that... What was the story, Steph? I don't even remember. I told you to put your face on the carpet and pray to the Lord and shut up and stop bothering us and see what happened. And you said that you <laughs> found some, well, I, like, I, what I, was I, it? Your grandfather, it was like something that your grandfather had lost. Your, what was it? A coin? A his gold tooth. Oh, his gold tooth. That's right. Yeah. There you go. The Lord did no, you I, some good, Ma. I like hanging out with you guys more than um, my atheist friends, you know? Because you need to join, you need to join the club. No, I'm not quite there, buddy. But well, you would have been right at home earlier. Yeah, everyone missed like the first like hour. It was like all like ultra political conversation. Oh, uh, yeah, you guys start too early for me. I'm I'm still watching Gail and uh, Tony DeCoplis and uh, on uh, CBS when you guys are going at it. I gotta wake up. Oh, you guys also missed the uh, the politician, the congressman, saying the moon was made out of gas. Anyone hear that what? in the news? Yeah, I heard that. It's like Sheila Jackson Lee or Sheila Lee Jackson or whatever. It's like, is it California? A re con representative in Congress. Um, yeah, she was giving this big speech. It looked like at a college or university, like the podium was all up there and everything. And it was about the eclipse. And she's like, yeah, and, you know, the, the moon, and maybe one day we can live on it. But, you know, it's it's really big and it's made out of gas. So I don't know if it would support that. And, you know, it's better than the sun, though, because the sun's like almost too hot to get close to. Like, oh dear, these are people running our lives. Anyone have a dream about that? <laughs> yeah, um, not my life. Well, good Lord told me to get some chickens and get off the grid so she could say whatever she wants. I'm growing my own food. Leave me alone. Look up. It was chemtrails are poisoning your food. What? 
<laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, anyway, so, uh, I didn't really have much uh, I wanted to talk about, but just hanging out. Anyone else have a quick final thought before I got to gotta go? Yeah, one wow. last thing. Listen, I know that Todd saw Bob, but I still have not seen Bob. Just for the uh, record. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, hey, is Chris still on here? Chris, uh, I mean, he, he's Chris on here, on. but oh, okay. he's not. To, to, he left earlier. He's, he's not presently with us, but so yes, is he is still on the app. See, I, I, don't, I can't keep track of all your inner politics, like of who's – I know Steph is the devil. Nate, you know, he's tried to be the moderator, but um, – and I know Chris, because you guys disagree a lot on the Bible, so. Who, Steph and Chris? Don't... Yeah, all you guys, you kind of like – you splinter off into all these little all groups you guys. and sections. Who's you guys? Yeah. No, we all agree you. on the vast majority. All of you. Huh? I mean, I'm just on the right side. Whoever wants to come to my camp, come on. <laughs> you have the right. You have you know the right way that. that <laughs> yeah, but even the most to... that's that's the thing. Like from a from a you know atheist on the outside, it's like all the because like Christians, unless it's an explicit Bible room, like Christians don't have um you know we all agree on stuff, uh, the big stuff. So it's like by the time people come in, like not all Christians the big gonna, stuff though. Well, 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 hold hold on a minute. Um, I'm. I'm just trying to get to the actual point. I'm trying to make yeah. sure Courtney wants to say something. But um, so so because Christians typically, unless it's a Bible room focused on like a Bible study or something where everyone's all harmonious, which is usually private. So no one knows that because they want you godless atheists kept out. Um, unless it's something like that, which there are those rooms. I'm never in them, but there are there. Um, Christians are going to argue because it's like, well, if you're not trying to like, you know, be harmonious and, you know, have a Bible study, then what else are you going to talk about? Well, you're going to talk about your differences. So when an atheist just comes in or a non-religious person or a Muslim comes in and sees Christians arguing, they think, wow, you guys can't even get on the same page about anything. While most of the time, the things they're arguing about, in, in my humble opinion, the Bible's opinion, <laughs> is, is not a salvation issue. It, it's just like tiddly stuff way down the road, like free will, not free will, once saved, always saved, like all this stuff that has no bearing on salvation issues whatsoever. Um and, and anyway, so it's like, wow, you guys can't ever agree. It's like, no, we all agree on the big stuff. That being said, to your point, Mole, there are some things that are actual salvation issues, uh, but those are few and far between. If you have someone that's like, no, you need to do X, Y, Z and for your salvation. And, oh, Jesus is fine. Or Jesus is not God. I mean, there are like uh, some disagreements on, on salvation issues, but those are way few and far uh, between compared to the overwhelming amount of just nonsense people fight about that has nothing to do with salvation issues. But Courtney, yeah, see, she, her hand was raised. Oh, go ahead, Courtney. Just want to give her a chance real fast. Yeah, I was just saying, like, in the chat, um, I was trying to say it, but I wasn't saying it well. Um, the once, <laughs> this is unrelated to what you guys were just saying, but to Kevin, once a language goes from pictographic, like, when you when you think of pictographic, think of, like, um, like emojis. Once things go from like emojis into an actual defined sound and a symbol that represents the sound and not the idea anymore, you can't back translate. So, because like if a symbol of a, a horse becomes an H, right? If there's an actual horse, that's the emoji symbol, the pictographic symbol, and it becomes the sound H, that then no longer means horse. It means H, huh, H, H. Huh. So, so if you see something that's got like horse, dog, and then something else, you can't go, huh, B, and then something, and then try and build a message from huh, B, and then whatever the other third symbol is, and back translate, and then say that that's what the original message meant. Because once it takes on the sounds, it no longer has the original meaning. This is why pictographic messages have like hundreds of letters or hundreds of symbols, and then it gets deduced down to like 26 because those symbols are no longer relevant and it becomes what the sounds mean. So once a sound is given to a specific symbol, then you use the symbol to communicate, not the uh, emoji that was previously the quote. Courtney, are you, Courtney, yeah, are you I, saying? I, uh, I, I agree with you. Um, no problems there. Um, but, that, but that wasn't what I was saying. I wasn't talking about the phonetic uh, understanding versus the pictograph understanding. Um, I didn't see letters. So oh, yeah, I, I don't know. Then if you, unless unless you're talking about like the gematria, which Hebrew does represent. No, no, no. I wasn't. I wasn't using gematria either. I wasn't oh. using gematria. No. 
all, all, all I was doing was, um, from what I studied, how they count, it's just basic counting, not, not Gamatria, just basic counting and just looking at whatever it was matched up with. But right. it was just a curiosity to me. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. No, saying I, yeah, that. I get you. I'm just saying. I don't think a lot. When you called it Paleo Hebrew, Paleo Hebrew is not actually pictographic Hebrew. But a lot of people think that on the internet. But like, like it says one and two. That is Aleph Bet. So if you had a, like a dream that said one and two, and then you relate that to like Aleph meaning one, Bet meaning two, then that could spell Av, which means father. But. So if you right. Have a- so so no no no. I have no problem. Like uh, okay, if, if, okay. You, if you can, uh, go ahead and um, uh, if you if you want to mess around with that, it's cool. It's, it's just something that's, that I'm curious about. Um, uh, like I said, I had a dream in 2009. I, I really don't talk about it that much unless someone's talking about dreams. Hence today. Um, but um, yeah. I mean, if you want to look at it that way, then I'm, I'm I really want to hear your feedback and what you, what you have on it. Well, I mean, the Except only thing that guy, I, I like think it means what, 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 that... uh, Hang on, guys. Uh, hang on. I, I, set your alarm for 7 a.m. and everyone be here tomorrow. But I, I, it's going to have to be in another room where he explains it because I really have to go. Um, but, Courtney, real fast, someone did have a question I, I wanted to I wanted to let them ask. It's it's in chat. They text me. Oh. Um, and, and then and then Mo can have a yeah. final word and then we'll run. But um, And, by the way, I, is the Gemetri, is that the Hebrew? I don't want to get into it. Um, I don't have that time. But, basically, one of my friends um, – they were super freaked out because I think it was like the Gometria thing, how they do like the letters and numbers and translate to Hebrew or whatever. But he like put he was like putting in names and like put in this one name. I guess he was on a mission to find the Antichrist somehow because that makes sense. Anyway, so he did it and it like came up in this name as like six 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 or something. And he like called me like freaking out. He's like, Oh my gosh, I know who the Antichrist is. I know who the Antichrist is. He's like he, he like, wouldn't even tell me. I had to get on like a secure app and all this stuff. I'm like, <laughs> bro. I'm like just Keep your eyes on Jesus. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the question is, um, do the names in the genealogy of Genesis speak about the one who's going to die for the man? Um, it depends on how you want to translate it, because Hebrew words can have multiple di- different translations. For example, the word Noah, which is in that, means comfort. Um, so they say, you know, it brings comfort and rest. Um, the word Asher um, can mean blessed, but it can also mean happy. So there's multiple different ways to translate it. And it's pr- pretty, it's a vague message. Theoretically speaking, I guess you could derive something from it. It's not out of the norm. It's very common in Judaism, which is kind of what Gamatria is. It's when you assign, uh, specific letters to specific numbers. So like Aleph means one. So every time you see like an Aleph, that means one. It's kind of how we do with like you know how we used to do it in school, like when you send fake messages to your friend and you, you already have, but the people have to already know what it is, and then you can translate that. But it, it's not, um, it doesn't work if there's like a textual variant. The moment you run into a textual variant in a manuscript, then it messes the whole message up. Right. Okay, um, so it could or could not. Uh, hang on, Kevin, I'm sorry, I really don't have time. Um, Mo, uh, give us your final thought that you wanted to say earlier, and then I really have to run. Kevin, just oh, back. Have a great rest of your day. All right, yeah, and uh, Kevin Courtney, or uh, I don't know. Do you guys want to keep going, Steph? Do you want you want to mod this thing? Like, I, I don't. I just have to leave. I mean, I don't get to. Oh, I, I gotta. I mean, I gotta run it. It's not a big deal. Oh, Kevin okay. can back channel me. I don't want to take up your room. You're you're good. All right, guys, or be here tomorrow. Everyone have a good day. Take care. See you all, all right. later. Good to talk to you. All right, bye, guys.